may know, but with Media Commons, Wikidata, and all of that also are part of the foundation too. So as part of our way of bridging, bridging the content gap, we also embark on advocacy and other educational programs as well, which has brought us here, the Ghana Polls. So the Ghana Polls is an initiative to drive content about the Ghanaian elections on Wikipedia and other Wikimedia projects. We are proud to have partnered with Code for Africa and the Wikimedia Ghana user group for this project. This is part of the whole project. This isn't the project itself. This is merely a part of the project. This is the training on this information and this information, particularly for our people in the media and then our volunteer editors. Why this? We do this because we rely on you to get information onto Wikipedia. We need accurate sources to cite when we are writing our stories on Wikipedia. And we believe that if we have this and then everyone is equipped on the kind of stories to write, it makes our stories more credible online. Um, when you check Wikipedia statistics, we have only two percent of content on Wikipedia being from Africa. And out of that, we have less than half of the contributions being from Africans themselves. So we have to do something about it. We need to work hard together. This is also a way of reintroducing our space to you and inviting you to also join our community with your expertise in the media. We know that you do a great job if you would have to add um, story writing on Wikipedia to that. So this is why we are here. And once again, I'm honored to welcome you all. I'm looking forward to a very impactful session and an engaging session. Some of the sessions will be virtual, but it doesn't stop us from um, you know, interacting with others. There'll be chance for questions and answers, and I encourage all of you to participate fully. I know that it would be impactful. At the end, I'm sure that there'll be a survey to find out how it went and I'm hoping for positive results. So welcome, enjoy the session, and please engage. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I know that my colleagues, Phoenix, and then the executive director of Open Foundation West Africa have spoken to length about what we do and then why we are here. So not to waste, waste too much time, we're going straight to the very first session for today. So we have our guest who is online. Unfortunately, he cannot make it in person. So we are going to interact with him virtually. So I would leave him to introduce himself. Then we can officially start the session. Are we all ready? Thank you. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. Uh, my name is Hi, Martin. 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 Uh, hello. Hi, can you hear me clearly? Hi, can you hello, hear me clearly? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Yes, we can hear. Yes, can we, we can hear. Can we all hear Martins? Brilliant. Uh, so, uh, once again, my name is Martins. Uh, Martins Ayotunde. Uh, I'm a journalist, a fact checker, and media trainer. Uh, I'm based in Nigeria. The introduction can go back to the audience. Hi, Martins. Hello. Yeah, so, uh, if should I, I go to proceed? Okay, I think you should just proceed. Just proceed. All okay. right, all right, guys. Uh, let, let, let me just share my screen then. OK. 
Okay, uh, I want to assume we can all see my screen. Yes, and, uh, we can. Based on the introduction, uh, the session is primarily on uh, how to fact check misinformation and disinformation. And I'm going to be sharing some strategies, some tools, and how we can combat misinformation, especially during elections. Uh, like I said earlier, my name is Martins. Uh, Martins Ayatunde, I'm a fact checker. I'm a data journalist and uh, I'm also a media trainer. And I've been doing this for about five years now. And uh, I've not tried Ghana Jollof uh, before, but I'm really looking forward to it. I know that uh, countries have this tendency to engage in Jollof. Africa, I'll go into that later on. Uh, we are the largest indigenous network of civic tech and open data journalism labs in Africa. Uh, this map shows our presence on the continent, our main offices, our partners, and we have a number of networks, uh, Cardinal among which is the African Fact Checking Alliance, uh, which is a network of professional fact checkers across the continent. And we have a number of other investigative analysis and forensic units. Uh, for today's session, are going to deal with four main things, uh, which is an overview of fact-checking and why it is important during elections. Uh, we'll also learn how to identify and debunk claims. Uh, we'll go into some of the tools to do that. And lastly, we'll touch briefly on social media monitoring uh, during elections. So you all will agree with me that uh, social media is where the election uh, campaign or the misinformation, disinformation, uh, uh, propaganda, the PR, a lot happens on social media these days, especially during elections. Uh, in the past years, it used to be on the mainstream media on TV. It's important uh, that we also learn how to uh, monitor its speech, how to monitor this information on social media during elections. Uh, for any objectives, it's my belief that by the end of this session, you understand the concept of misinformation and disinformation and how they can impact elections. Also, uh, to understand uh, fact-checking techniques and be able to apply them uh, to real-time disinformation campaigns uh, before, during, and after election. Also, I expect that by the end of the session, we are equipped uh, with the requisite knowledge to analyze sensitivities, uh, monitor e speech, and, you know, uh, things that can potentially influence what that behavior and public perception. Uh, so before I start, I know that uh, we are active players in the media space, and uh, we must have come across an incident or two uh, of misinformation, especially uh, during this campaign period. Uh, uh, this past couple of days, I've tried to spend on Ghana Twitter. I've seen the number myself, uh, but would anyone like to share with me any memorable instance of misinformation uh, that you've come across? Uh, during these particular elections, uh, just anyone uh, can just, you know, have the mic and just uh, share their experience with us. Anyone? Any memorable incidents or instance of misinformation? Anyone, please? Hmm. Okay, if, if no one will share, I think I can share one. Uh, I, I'm not sure I remember the names. Uh, not necessarily misinformation. Of course, there was misinformation element. Uh, but one very interesting thing I saw yesterday uh, was one, uh, one of the political actors uh, was kind of making some uh, incendiary remarks, uh, mocking, uh, I think, an ex-president's disability. And it was trending, and you know, uh, people were uh, enraged, and you know, demanding an apology. I think I even saw a procession or a protest uh, to that effect, where people were demanding that uh, this particular political actor apologizes. And uh, eventually, I saw one tweet that he had apologized, but upon further ch upon further checks, I realized that that was uh, that was false. I know his political party disowned him, uh, basically released a statement and said, oh, this, this guy's uh, 
opinions does not represent the party. Uh, but yeah, uh, incidences like that, uh, of course, they are unfortunate, but they are also an opportunity for people to spread this information. All right. Uh, so quickly, let's uh, look at the basics of fact-checking and why it is important during election. Uh, but before we can talk about fact-checking, uh, we have to treat information disorder. Uh, fact-checking became a necessity because of this disorder, this particular information disorder. And uh, information disorder is basically, uh, it basically has three branches, uh, which is malinformation, disinformation, misinformation. No, we might not uh, be new to this concept, uh, but I'm just going to give us a quick refresher. Uh, so malinformation is usually information that is based on reality or used with the intention to harm. Uh, for instance, private emails, uh, maybe even between politicians uh, and their mistresses or uh, lovers, for instance. And uh, this information might be true, but the intent of making it public is to cause harm, to uh, malign, to damage reputation. Okay? Uh, so this is information that is actually factual, that is correct, but the intent uh, is to cause harm. Then we have this information, which is false information that is also deliberately created with the intent to cause harm. Uh, you'll be seeing a lot of this during the elections as political parties fight for votes. Uh, they will start overstating the achievements. Uh, if a politician constructs five kilometers of road, he can say he constructed 50. And it can even be from the opposing party, you know, uh, making spurious claims that, oh, this party... Uh, they have been so bad, they have done this, they have done that. So this is information that is outrightly false, uh, not just false, deliberately planted, deliberately placed with the intention to cause harm. And last but not the least, uh, we have misinformation. Uh, misinformation is false information, of course, information that is not correct, that is not factual, that is fake, uh, but uh, created not with the intent to cause harm. Uh, sometimes they are just... Uh, mistakes i don't know uh, if i can use that word uh, but sometimes people tend to mix up things and uh, genuinely share false information under the pretext of uh, you know accurate information so this is false uh, but it's not created with intention to cause harm so uh, let me just go over them quickly my information based on reality is true but it is spread with intention to cause harm this information is the worst of both worlds it is false and it's deliberately planted, deliberately created to cause harm. And misinformation, on the other hand, is false, but it could be an honest mistake uh, that is just, you know, how they're in public domain and people uh, innocently share them. Uh, so, yeah, this is false, but not with the intent to cause harm. Now, why do people fall for fake news? Uh, before I go into my answers, I'll probably just uh, want to throw this at the audience. Uh, why do you think people believe uh, certain information that they see? I know that because of our level of media literacy, uh, because we are active players in the media sector, there are certain things that you see and how to say, oh, this is fake. Uh, but for the average Joe, for the ordinary person, uh, they tend to believe. So what do you think uh, makes people fall for misinformation? Why do they believe fake news? Uh, anyone? Anyone? Please, you need a okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so, uh, sorry, I can't hear you clearly. Can you kind of speak up? Sorry, please. So, I'm saying that in the context of elections, yeah, because of this or political leanings, so you is for instance, the end. Hear something about the NDC, he's likely to believe it. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. I, I very much agree with you. Uh, any other person? Yes, we have one more. Well, the same point. Okay, keep. Yeah. I would think that the issues that they give, while they believe it, have Okay. Any. Okay. 
correlate with their own perception of negative biases in the way they see the content of the report, especially in the middle of the middle of the Okay. Okay, Martins. Yeah, I had issues uh, with audio, I think, for the last two speakers. Uh, but oh. from what I had before that, I think uh, uh, people agree that um, your political leanings can affect how you perceive information, and uh, certain biases can also uh, make you susceptible to certain kind of misinformation. And of course, this aligns uh, with the cogent, the cardinal reasons why people for misinformation. The first thing is confirmation bias. Uh, this is when you already have your bias beliefs, you have your beliefs, existing beliefs. Uh, like the example the first speaker gave, if you're a member of a certain political party and you see uh, negative news, negative information about your opponents, uh, without double checking, you just tend to accept it as true. Uh, if they say, oh, uh, Baumia is, uh, uh, is, 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 has done this, Baumia has done that, and you know, you're not a fan of Baumia. You say, Yes, oh, this boy have been saying this man is bad for the country, this and that, and this and that. So, if you already have pre existing beliefs, if you already have your biases, you already have your political leanings, there are certain information that you see uh, that you tend to believe easily. And it goes both ways. Uh, if you see positive news about the party you support, uh, without thinking twice, you want to share, you want to amplify without verifying, and you know. Uh, this is one of the reasons why people fall for misinformation. The second thing is emotional appeal. Emotion is one of the greatest barriers to critical thinking. If something can connect with us emotionally, uh, if you see a video that upsets you, for instance, if you see a video that annoys you, for instance, maybe, uh, you know, high-handedness by authorities, uh, maybe it's a video that says, oh, see how police is brutalizing supporters of this political party. And, you know, based on how the video looks, and how upsetting it is, uh, there's a chance you believe, all right? If a video can connect with you emotionally, if a message can connect with you emotionally, uh, critical thinking becomes secondary, and you tend to believe it. Uh, the last thing is reiteration effect. Uh, this is when something uh, gets regurgitated, uh, you know, you keep hearing it, uh, you turn on your TVs, you hear it on TV, uh, you enter your car, turn on your radio, you hear it, you want to relax on TikTok, you see the same video, uh, you're discussing with your friend, they say the same thing. Even if you had doubts at first, and you know you had legitimate reasons not to believe, uh, the number of times you hear it, 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 it makes you start questioning yourself. All right? I don't know if anyone has experienced that before, uh, but there's a way you start asking yourself if you are not make, make, mixing things, if you are getting it correctly. Uh, so the way, uh, if something is repeated again and again and again, uh, you tend to just accept it as true. And this does not necessarily mean it's true. Uh, there are instances where you see paid campaigns and these people, they plant it in different platforms, influencers, uh, even bots, you know, and you keep seeing it, you keep seeing it, you keep seeing it. And uh, the more we are exposed to such information, uh, the more likely uh, we are to believe it. So quickly, uh, what is fact-checking? Uh, I like to go with very simple definitions and it's as simple as it sound. Fact checking is basically checking the facts. All right. Uh, if you want to go theoretical, you can say, oh, this is the process of doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that. But the simple definition, the simple explanation that encapsulates uh, the definition of fact checking is simply checking of facts. It's a process of verifying if all the information uh, in a piece of, uh, it could be a speech, it could be a social media post just want to make sure that all the facts are accurate, all the facts are correct, all the uh, claims made by a politician, they are accurate, they are factual. Uh, it's as simple as that, okay? And as journalists, uh, we have a role. We have a very, very serious role to play in providing people with accurate information. Uh, we are at a time where trust in the media is declining and people don't uh, trust journalists again. They don't trust our news. So it is very, very important that whatever we are also putting out is also very, very factual. So a fact checking is very, very important for us as journalists. And uh, it has become more prevalent because uh, this information these days is, is, is growing at an alarming rate, especially during crucial times like elections. Uh, there a lot of misinformation will be on social media, even on mainstream media. 
a politicians will make unguarded statements and it's our responsibilities as journalists, as fact checkers, as to make sure that we have a closer look. We zoom in into these issues and we are able to spot uh, the lies. We are able to spot uh, the things that are taken out of context. We are able to spot the things that are misleading and properly educate the people. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, during elections, particularly during elections, misinformation and disinformation will always be on the rise. It will skyrocket. Uh, so if you are encountering it at uh, a mild level, a moderate level before, naturally you expect that it goes up, all right? And that brings us to why fact-checking during election is important, okay? Now, misinformation during election can lead to violence. Uh, in this part of the world, when uh, our elections are not so peaceful, I'm not trying to generalize here, but at least I know that in Nigeria, we're always having election violence, and in some other parts of uh, Africa, misinformation can stoke tensions. It can, you know, uh, drive people to be violent, right? Uh, people can see uh, a piece of information that, oh, they are cheating, or oh, this is happening, they are stealing boxes, and, you know, they want to fight, they want to defend their votes, they want to uh, defend their positions, and, you know, uh, this can lead to crisis, you know, and it could even uh, shut down the economy, become a refugee problem, and all that. And we have people who are doing this deliberately. We have politicians who have dedicated team of, um, I will not call them disinformation campaigners, but they have PR teams. They call them PR, but, you know, we know they do beyond PR, they spread misinformation. But they have teams that, you know, is helping them push their agenda on social media, push their propaganda on social media. And, you know, we have to keep up, all right? Because most of, most of this information, there are no mistakes. I know I, dis I define misinformation and disinformation. Uh, more often than not, this false information you find during elections are deliberately created. You see them altering images, manipulating videos, even carrying videos from other parts of the world and presenting them as, oh, this is happening in Ghana. And it could be a video from Rwanda, it could be a video from Nigeria. So it is really important that, uh, you know, we are also up to speed. We are meeting them at their level, you know, just to be able to debunk whatever they are putting out. And this misinformation can include smear campaigns. Sometimes they want to damage the reputation of their opponents. Uh, they want to malign their opponents. And, you know, uh, this is really, really bad because it can affect how people make their choices. It can alter people's opinion about certain politicians, about certain political parties, and influence their choice during the election. So it is important that uh, fact-checking is taken seriously, especially during the election, so that we don't allow misinformation to fester. We don't allow it to go unchecked uh, so that people don't make wrong choices. If people are going to choose, it should be their decision. It should not be influenced. Uh, but when you um, when you don't fact-check information, uh, people tend to see false information and believe it, and by extension, it affects uh, their political choices. So uh, I think I've been able to do justice to that. Also, quickly, how do you identify claims? Uh, what are the types of uh, disinformation techniques that we've identified from other elections that you guys should be on the lookout for in Ghana. Uh, before then, uh, let's just quickly look at the kind of claims that you should fact check, uh, especially in times like this. You should always try and look for unattributed claims that are presented as fact. Uh, you should make sure that any statement attributed to someone is actually made by the person. Okay? Uh, so anytime you see un unattributed claims, anonymous claims, try and fact check it. Uh, when the claims can cause harm, any claim that is talking. Uh, tribal tech just mentions that you know this thing can cascade into a broader crisis. Just make sure that uh, if I check that anything that is going viral, uh, there will be plenty of claims. We can't tackle all of them, but we can make sure that the ones that are you know having a number of engagements, having reasonable amounts of views, uh, things that are going viral, we just can you know make sure that we nip it in the bud uh, before it becomes a problem. Then public figures, political actors, of course, we have to fact check whatever they put out. And we also have to weigh public interest. This piece of information that this person is putting out, how does it affect the common man? Uh -huh. So some, some claims, they are not worth wasting your time over uh, because maybe they don't um, they don't carry much weight. Okay, So you have to just evaluate it. How does this claim affect the average person? Uh, then you know if you can uh, fact check it. 
it caused direct harm to, to members of the public and if it's a threat to social cohesion. And like I said, you can see some claims that are trying to stoke tribal tensions, religious tensions, and you come across that I quickly try and debunk it so that people know that it is false. And uh, to identify these kind of claims, basically, social media is our ground, is the battleground. So just make sure that you have a presence across multiple social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Just, you know, scrutinize them, go through them, and make sure that uh, whatever information they are putting out uh, is not false. I know we are going to go into that in the subsequent slides. Another thing you can do is identify propaganda accounts. I mentioned earlier that most politicians already have teams, propaganda teams that, you know, will spread misinformation. So if you can just identify one or two, just be monitoring what they are doing. In fact, I advise you join these groups, you know, just be be, be inside so that anytime they say what is uh, untrue, what is factually inaccurate, you can quickly uh, debunk. Then speeches, politicians will be talking in those spirit. And some of their speeches, some of their utterances, because they are just trying to uh, convince people, they are trying to campaign. Uh, they just start saying sweet things, and sometimes some of these sweet things are not in, are not accurate. They are not factual. Uh, so we just make sure that uh, you are fact checking speeches, fact checking campaign speeches, social media uh, statements, anything that politicians are putting out. Just look at it and see if it is accurate. Then significance. Make sure that. Uh, what you are spending your time on is newsworthy, okay? And uh, make sure that you are fact checking what is important to the average person. And uh, some claims, like I said, uh, they carry weight because of who is making them. Uh, you can't fact check every claim. Uh, people will always, supporters will always speak if the person is not so prominent, if the person is not someone that uh, has a number of following or uh, someone that people don't even take their statement seriously, you know. Just make sure that uh, you don't you're not wasting your time on such accounts. Now, let me uh, look at some of the strategies that uh, we see before elections, during elections, and after elections. Uh, please, uh, if I'm moving too fast, do let me know. Um, trying to make sure that uh, we cover uh, everything that we need to. Uh, but if I'm moving too fast, please uh, just indicates so that I can go over whatever I've said before. Now, these are some of the typical examples that we see uh, during elections. The first example here is claims that some aspirants are withdrawn. You know, uh, this is just mainly to encourage voter party, to make people disinterested, that, oh, the candidate you are supporting has withdrawn. Uh, this one says, dear Jubilee party member, this one about the circumstances, we have withdrawn our candidates. This is false, uh, but the intention is just to uh, make people believe that that candidate is no longer on the ballot. Uh, so claims like this will surface. Uh, this next one is about false voter registration deadline in Uganda. You might not see it in this form. Uh, someone can claim that, oh, they have amended the electoral law. Uh, voting by proxy can be done irrespective of where you are. Just vote by proxy. You know, people can even wake up and say voter ID is no longer required. So uh, these are some of the examples. This is also done with the intention to uh, discourage people from coming out, uh, probably in areas where politicians have opponents. You know, your opponent is likely to win, and uh, your strategy will probably be to just discourage people from coming out. Uh, this one is from Ghana, and these are fake digital cards. You know, people just put pictures and slam uh, a statement on it. And because we are media literate, we might be able to see through it. But for ordinary people, for everyday people, uh, you know, they might not. So this attacker says, uh, I believe this is Baumia, that the hardship in 2016 was more bearable than it is now. Uh, and it says something interesting, that when you check in terms of percentage, when you check the hardship in terms of percentage, MPP has done better. Now, I, I, I don't know how audacious uh, Ghanaian politicians are, but I don't think any politician would be so bold to come and start comparing hardship you know, it's, like, it's a kind of hardship Olympics that, oh, there was hardship, but in terms of percentage, hardship under uh, better. I don't think people would to come and say that during elections. But, you know, you see people saying these things. You see people make, manufacturing these kind of cards so that uh, people tend to say, oh, imagine, see what Baumia is saying. Hardship is uh, worse in 2016. You know, people just get offended and all. So this is fake, and this is created with the intention to malign 
or to uh you know turn public uh, perception or, or influence negative sentiments towards this particular candidate. So you see a lot of fake digital cards, fake quotes. So uh, these are some of the tactics that we see. Another thing is Wikipedia alterations. I'm very happy that we have Wikimedians in our midst. Another thing people do during elections is to alter Wikipedia pages. Because Wikipedia as a platform uh, is reputable, uh, is trustworthy. People rely on it for information. Uh, some of these political actors that are into this information are aware. Uh, so what they do is just go and manipulate, edit these pages, and you know share the screenshots on social media that, oh, uh, see what is happening with this person, see what is happening with this person. For instance, this example I have here is uh, of Nigeria's president. His age on Wikipedia was edited 84 times. At some point, they said it was 124 years. At some point, they said it was three years. At some point, they said it was 72. So this creates confusion. This controversy is about his age. Uh, it's, it's, it's a political score point. And, you know, opposition are saying, oh, we don't even know how old this man is. He's lying about his age because of this Wikipedia alteration. And when people check Wikipedia, they see it on social media, they even go the extra mile to check and see it. You know, they tend to believe it because a lot of people who don't know that ordinary people can read Wikipedia pages. They assume that information on Wikipedia is, 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 um, is foolproof. So usually what Wikimedia and editor does is that they kind of put the article in semi-protected mode or even protect it from alteration. So when you see political actors that uh, there are a lot of controversies around them, people tend to quickly uh, go and start manipulating uh, their Wikipedia accounts, their Wikipedia pages. So anytime you spot that, just try and make sure that you kind of protect that so that people don't take advantage of the trust, the credibility of Wikipedia uh, to mislead, to misinform. All right. Uh, another thing is water turnout using old photos. So uh, 2016, 2020, I believe there were elections in Ghana. Some of the pictures from those elections will resurface if they have not even started resurfacing already. Uh, but if you've not seen them, they will still come. Okay. People will use pictures from old elections, pictures from elections in other countries and pass it off as uh, something that probably happened on election day. Similarly, you see videos, ballot bus snatching, election irregularities. You see videos of instances like that lifted from other regions, lifted from other countries. You know, old videos, and people would attempt to pass them off as new, you know. So when you just see that certain videos are going viral and people are claiming that, oh, this is happening in this place, this is there's violence in this polling unit, there's violence in this part of the country. Just try and verify the video. So of course, we are going to go into verifying that. Uh, but yeah, it's important that we understand these tactics. Another thing, especially after elections, is start seeing information that people have considered defeat. You know, and this is fake. This is wrong. Uh, this particular picture uh, was manipulated. And you can see they put Kiamba live when Jiku accept defeat. But this is not false. So we are going to see a lot of that again. It's going to... I, I'm, I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom. Uh, but we are going to see these things at play. Okay, so I just want us to be prepared for them uh, and make sure that you reach out to the politicians in person to confirm that indeed they have considered defeat or they are withdrawn from the race. And lastly, we are going to see fake election results. Either the rule of the thumb is to wait for the Electoral Commission to announce results. But on social media, even while election is still ongoing, results will start flying. You start seeing, oh, this person has won. This person has, you know, uh, defeated by this margin. You start seeing figures. You start seeing figures. So as fact checkers, we should make sure that whatever information that we see on social media is coming from the authorized body. Uh, so when you see people cooking up results, we should just try and fact check it and inform people that, oh, results have not been officially announced. This is misleading. This is false. This is fake. Uh, so that people don't make uh, wrong assumptions or people don't uh, make choices based on those false information. So yeah, there will be a lot of wrong election results. Before elections results are announced, uh, people will start peddling all sorts of election results. Uh, so we should just be on the lookout for that. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have any other tactic that you must have noticed. Uh, maybe if you've covered elections in the past and uh, you've seen some uh, these disinformation strategies uh, and uh, you have any more that you can share with us. Uh, I know we have some very, very veteran journalists among us, uh, people who have been in the profession for quite a while. 
and I've covered elections a number of times. So uh, if you have any experience you want to share with us, uh, I appreciate that. Anyone? Okay, it doesn't seem like we have any. But so far, any... do you have any questions? So do we have any questions? So would anyone want to share an experience you had during the last election? Anyone? Chief, you are smiling in there. You look like you are reminiscing on events. <laughs> oh, just one person, please. Someone should go and say first. Yeah, just one person. Oh, my. Yeah. Election time. Any fascinating events that happen? So you guys are media people. I know you mm -hmm. are eloquent. So yeah. I'm <laughs> You guys are fired. But this one is going to be bashing the politicians on radio. Now you are here at the place you are calling. Okay, a uh, lot of questions. Okay, questions. Any questions? Uh, if there are none, I can just proceed. Uh, there will still be room to ask questions later on. I can't hear you. Can he proceed? Hey, this one is saying yes. Okay, uh, so let's look at uh, how we can fact check claims during elections. Uh, so one of the ways that misinformation is spread during elections is with images, images and videos. Uh, we are in a time when uh, they're saying that a thousand words or a picture is worth a thousand words, okay? And uh, if something is visual, it it's, it's, uh, connects with us better. We kind of, you know, relate and all that. So there's a lot of images, you know, going on as fake news. And beyond images... There's a new uh, sheriff in town, which is videos. Uh, in fact, we check most of these platforms. They have a lot of video content. I know Twitter or X, as it's called now, uh, they have a lot of it. Uh, TikTok. Uh, so images, videos are some of the best ways that uh, these disinformation campaigners use now. Uh, sometimes how they do it is simply by using photos out of context. So a photo might not necessarily be fake, but the context, the caption might be misleading. So the picture can be from Nigeria's election, and someone can say, oh, see what is happening in Kumasi, all right? Uh, sometimes they actually alter these pictures, digital, digital alterations, okay? Uh, they manipulate them, they cut, uh, they crop, you know, those sorts of, sort of stuff. And now with AI, it's even easier. You can use AI to manipulate a picture with ease. So uh, there's a lot of that happening these days. Then sometimes they combine it with text. Uh, in instances where you need translation, for instance, maybe... Uh, people can't speak English. Uh, you need to translate or translate the caption. People can put a different caption or an entirely misleading caption for it. So uh, that can also be used to manipulate readers and cropping out images to leave us some details. Uh, you know. Uh, so let's let's look at some examples. Uh, this is where I'll be really needing you guys to uh, to help out uh, because this this is this is like Q and A. Okay. Uh, so these images, I believe you can see them clearly. I would be requiring you to spot what you think is wrong with them. Now, before we do that, let me just quickly point out something. Uh, why there are tools that you can use to verify, you can use to fact check. Intuition remains the best method, okay? Uh, just look at the images yourself. Zoom, critically analyze them. Uh, look for inconsistencies. As much as, oh, you can just put it in Google reverse image search and you know, find out if it is manipulated, find out if it is fake. One of the very best ways, which should always be your starting point, which should always be your baseline, is to just check yourself, just examine, okay? So, yeah, who can spot what is wrong with this picture? Hmm, I may need to point people. I think I can see everybody clearly. Yes, Martin, please do. Okay. Brilliant. <laughs> hmm. Who will be my first? 
Okay, so because I don't know your names, uh, there is someone who is wearing what appears to be deep blue and is the fifth person on my right. And he has, he has a sound like this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what's wrong with this picture? Ah, I can barely hear you. I don't know if yeah, you can. I'll, I'll okay. read it, you know. All right, all right, brilliant. Okay. Okay, so he says the man kneeling photo is more pixelated than the man in the suit. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, is right. Uh, you can see that there's a sharp difference in quality, and uh, I'm not sure there's any camera that you have two people and one person's quality will be bad and the other person will be clear. Uh, so yeah, another thing uh, probably that we should also point out is that this person on the chair is not even acknowledging the person kneeling beside him. All right. Uh, no matter how um uh how annoyed or. or how angry it might be or whatever grief they have going on. There's no way someone will be not so closely to you and you don't even acknowledge the person. So it looks like uh, someone that is just looking at something in the distance rather than someone who is acknowledging who is kneeling down beside him. And if you can actually see the video very close, you can see that uh, this image of the man kneeling down is actually cropped. You can see some inconsistencies in the edges. Uh, in this area, for instance, where the knees are, you can see that there seems to be like a sharp line you know, just some of these inconsistencies that I can point out uh, that this image is manipulated. Uh, so let's quickly go into another one. Uh, hmm, who, who is going to be my next, next? Uh, I won't say victim, uh, but my next friend. Uh, so the person that is um, third on my left, sitting beside uh, the gentleman on green, I think he's a lady. Yeah. On your left. Yes, on my left, like this. Where I think she's looking at me. Uh, I don't know the color, but yeah. The lady is third on my left. I don't know if the camera is cutting anyone out. Okay. Can you can you describe the person? I didn't get that. <laughs> oh, oh, I just go to the left. Just be pointing them, I'll okay. tell you when you get to the right person. Okay. Uh, let me start scouting for my yeah. next friend. Okay. So, here? No. Here. No, no, you are turning. Turn back to that same uh, okay. row. Winter is coming. <laughs> no, not not uh, not her. Uh. Yeah, I think the next lady now. Yes. So yeah, what's wrong with this picture? No, uh, just Chris Carly look at it and try and spot it out. Okay. Uh, I think I, I I don't know, but was she able to spot anything wrong with the picture? No, she wasn't. All right, all right. Uh, so let me just explain because I have, I still have tons of example. Uh, I know that you are probably far from the screen, but there's a very blurry line between these two persons all right and uh the 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 way the pictures are fused together it shows that oh this is not natural this is not this is not normal and another very very important thing is the trouser here you can see that uh, it was coming straight down and it kind of became slanted as though the person's yeah. leg is cut off 
All right. Yeah. And so these are just some of the clues. Of course, uh, we are still going to use Google reverse image searches, Yandex, and the likes to probably check and find the original image. But these are some of the pointers that this image is manipulated. Uh, so I think uh, I'll wrap it up there. I still have more that we call on people to, to um, probably talk. So uh, don't relax. You could be the next person. Uh, so quickly, how do videos misinform? I also said a video is worth a thousand pictures. And that's literal because videos are motion pictures uh, that are made from fusing plenty of images together. All right. And uh, we, are in, we are in an era where everything is video, everything is video. In fact, online courses, uh, they, they, they are more video content these days. Uh, in the yesterday years, when you Google things, you want to read about it. Now you see videos, you want to repair something, you see videos, you want to operate, you bought a new blender, a new microwave, you want to see how it works. People don't read the manuals. And as much as uh, videos can be used for good, they can be used for bad as well. And uh, they can be used to misinform, all right? And uh, usually how, how this is done, um, misleading subtitles is one of them. Uh, this is a statement from Putin, for instance. I don't know how to speak Russian. I don't know if there's anyone that can speak Russian there. Uh, but people like us have to depend on translated subtitles. Now, if a bad actor uh manipulates this subtitle manipulates the translation you know we just we are we are left with no choice we consume false information you know and uh, we do it unknowingly so uh you can see instances of misleading subtitles sometimes it could be misleading captions if it's a picture or even 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 a video can be wrongly captioned and for people who depend on translation for people who don't understand the language uh, it might be difficult for you to know Some of the speeches made by politicians, they depend on people to translate and render an account of these speeches to them. So these things can be related. Okay, this is one of the ways that videos can be used to misinform. Another one is AI. Uh, we, are in an inst we, are in, we are in an era now that uh, AI generated videos are becoming a thing. I think I have one here uh, that is. Uh, this is Donald Trump. It says, uh, it says that uh, he endorsed uh, a politician in South Africa. So just listen. Greetings. All South Africans, my name is President Donald Trump. I urge all South Africans to vote for Omkanto Wesizwe, May 29th. The African National Congress of Cyril Ramaphosa has failed all South Africans with this new back party by President Jacob Zuma. All South Africans will matter. Vote M. Uh, so this one video allegedly of President Trump. I have another one that is actually uh, something like uh, President Trump has a message for Ghanaians and Bawumia. So let me just hear yeah. this. Four year term as a president and I came back from opposition, competed with the sitting Vice President Kamala Harris and have convincingly won the American elections. This is my brother Mahama. He also did his four-year term as president, and he is coming back from opposition to compete with the vice president of Ghana, Biawumia. Just like how I won against Vice President Kamala Harris, Mahama will also win convincingly against Vice President Biawumia. Biawumia, I know you, you are a bad boy. As a vice president, you have failed Ghanaians just like Kamala Harris failed Americans. History is on our side. God is on our side. Yeah, so let, let me just end it there. Uh, that, that sounds quite interesting. Uh, but like I said, it's one of the ways that um, videos can be used to misinform. And AI tools make it so easy. In the past, you had to sit down on Photoshop and start manipulating for hours. But now, uh, with AI tools, you can do it in seconds. And you can do it at a very larger scale. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of AI endorsements. All right. I know that the second one was a clip art with like a, more, with like a cartoon. But the first one, you can see it appeared like Trump was genuinely endorsing uh, you know, Jacob Zuma of South Africa. So, uh, before the election comes, you see, see a lot of AI videos. Uh, and now that Trump is even the man of the moment, I uh, you know that he will be at the head of the storm. You see a lot of people saying, oh, Trump uh, supports Baumia, Trump supports Mahama, and you know, stuff like that. Uh, so, you're going to see a lot of fake AI endorsements. Uh, so, there's just uh, 
look out for that. Now, let's go into the tools. Uh, but before we go into the tools, uh, let's cover some techniques. Like I said, it's important to use tools, but sometimes uh, some of this misinformation are not necessarily tools. Uh, so the first thing is to use trusted sources. Trusted sources, trusted resources. Uh, so if you are covering elections, if you want to fact check election, you want to find misinformation during election, first and foremost, you need to know the electoral guidelines. All right. I spent considerable time on the website of the Electoral Commission. I saw a number of, uh, you know, information that I probably did not know before. And, you know, I basically understood how the election works. I read things like uh, election by proxy, you know, uh, how it works, the instances where it is permitted. Uh, so a lot of people will just cook up things and say, oh, ID is not required. You don't need to come with your voter ID. So you are not going to use any tool to verify that. You have to come back to the guidelines. You have to come back to the election policies. Okay? Just go through what does the law say? What does the guidelines say? Is it true? Uh, so this is even going to come in very handy when you are, uh, you know, uh, trying to fact check false information. All right? So these kind of resources, uh, information on the official website of the Electoral Commission, uh, you know, your statements or legal statutes, dictates that can help you, trusted, relevant, authoritative sources, okay? Uh, someone can wake up and say that, oh, uh, voting by proxy is cancelled. As a journalist, as a fact checker, what you basically need to do is to check, has there been any instance where these laws have been repealed? You know, so you can't just wake up overnight and say voting by proxy has been cancelled. The constitutional matter is already captured, uh, captured in the uh, constitution in the electoral guidelines in the laws establishing the commission uh, so basically you would need things like this the election handbook when you see certain misinformation you refer to this info to these resources you go back to these uh, repositories and you're able to probably uh, you know combat such misinformation you're able to help people make informed choices all right and another thing i also said is election results election results should only come from the commission. I know that uh, as journalists, sometimes we can speculate based on what we are seeing on ground. Uh, oh, this person is having a comfortable lead. This person is probably going to win. At best, all those things are still speculations. There have been instances where uh, the media will speculate and the results will uh, disagree. So speculations are not facts. Speculations are not facts. So election results should only come from the authoritative body, the credible body, the body enshrined with that responsibility. Okay? And uh, when we are also verifying information, we should try and diversify our sources. Don't just do a Google reverse search and rest. You know, try and also check, call the people involved, just, you know, to make it more credible. Avoid relying on a single source. And don't even take politicians' word for it. Sometimes when you call this person and he gives you this information, don't hold it as fact. You can just go the extra mile, check with other people, other players, and make sure that that information is actually accurate. All right? And uh, the tools. Basically, we are going to cover two, uh, which is reverting image searches and uh, Invid. Now, I also mentioned that the first thing we need to do is to critically examine. Okay? So you should always look for red flags. When you see images, just look for mismatch lightning, irregularities, inconsistencies. Like some of the pictures I showed, someone pointed out that one picture was pixelated. Okay, so just uh, critically zoom, examine, look for inconsistencies, sharp edges, and the likes. So uh, with that, you can be quickly able to tell that this is fake, this is manipulated, and this is wrong. Also, everything you come across, especially during elections, don't take them as true. Always challenge, always verify. When you see information, don't believe if you verify. And look for inconsistencies. I think I mentioned that already. Mismatch lights. If the light on this person is brighter and this person is darker, like I said, the cameras are not biased. So they're not going to make one person look better and one person look horrible. So definitely it shows that maybe these pictures have been fused together. Maybe one picture has been lifted from another, uh, you know, circumstance and that surrounding and reintroduced and imposed into one of the pictures. So yeah, the sun is not biased. If they are under the sun, the lightning will reflect equally on everybody. And the camera that is taking the picture is also not biased, so it will capture it the way it is. Then poor quality. There are instances when people 
deliberately compress the pictures, they reduce the quality so that it is harder to, to, to spot, so that it is harder to notice. So yeah, uh, we can just uh, make sure that anytime we see a poor quality image, just make sure that you check very well and make sure that that information is accurate. Now, let's go into the tools. The first thing is reverse image search. Uh, there are a number of them. Uh, so I have the link here. I know the the uh, start might be shared with you guys later. Uh, but the one I'm going to really go into is Google Images or Google Lens. Uh, so to go to that, you just do image.google.com and it brings it to this. Then you can see this icon, search by image. Now let's look, go and give some of the examples that we have already. Uh, okay, let, let, let's start with this. So let me just take a quick screenshot of this image. Uh, I discourage screenshots uh, because when you screenshot, it suppresses the quality. Okay, so just try and download them fresh, then you use them, but just for the purpose of demonstration, uh, I can take a screenshot of this. Then click on this search by image, this icon here, then you can ask you to upload a file. So I'll just click on this. This is the screenshot I just took, select it, then search. So when you do, uh, you can see uh, this is a fact check that was done by PESA check, uh, which is part of Cultural Africa, that this image is fake. Uh, but beyond just that, you can see the original image uh, before it was manipulated. So usually I used to try and do find image source. This one here, I want to see the first use case of this image uh, so that I can make informed decisions. Uh, so let's also try another example uh, with this one. I uh, download the image. Uh, you come to Google Lens. Well, let me go back. Uh, you can just even come to Google. You see search by image here, and you just uh, upload, and you can tell if it has been manipulated. Once again, you can see uh, the first result here is uh, this image. This is a fact check. We already fact checked this. But if you keep scrolling, you you find the actual image. You know before it was manipulated. Uh, then let me just to find image source and uh, just scroll, scroll, scroll. So these are the fact checks. I think uh, the thing has been fact checked uh, quite a number of times. So let me just come back here and keep looking. Uh, so sometimes you might not get instant results. So what I want to do is to search this, just this person. Now I've dragged, I've dragged this, then you can now keep looking. So I think this is one of the, the um, images. And you can see the manipulated one on the left and the actual one on the right. And you can see that this man, this is um, a separatist leader in Nigeria and he was introduced into the picture later on. And you can also see that the book is different, all right? Uh, this one says a mat of roses. I don't know if it's clear enough, uh, but here you can see I am your king. So even this woman in the background was not uh, in the initial picture. So of course, this has been obviously manipulated. Yeah, so I hope that is clear. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's not just Google Lens, there's Yandex. I think we should try that. Yandex is uh, mainly uh, a Russian uh, search engine. So if you can find the image on Google, for instance, you can try Yandex. I mentioned that it's important for us to diversify our sources. Uh, so yeah, when you check, you can find it on Google Images. You can just check some of the other search engines. So I uh, just come to this camera icon here, click on it, then you can upload the image. All right, so just a minute. So yeah, you can see, some of the results here. I think this one is very close. Uh, this is William Ruto of Kenya. And uh, you can just look at the chair, uh, look at you know some of the details in the original picture. And when you find the uh, actual one before it was manipulated, you can efficiently and effectively say, oh, this is false, this is manipulated. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Yandex for African images, it's not the best, uh, it, should, it should not be your first option. Uh, but yeah, in the interest of diversifying your sources, you can also just 
uh, try it. But Google Google has virtually all the images that we need. Uh, it's the most few search engine in this part of the world. Uh, so most of the results uh, that you will need, you find them on Google. I hope that is clear and uh, we can proceed. Uh, so the next one is Invid. Invid is a Chrome extension. Uh, I've added the link here. I shared it with the organizers. I know you'll get it eventually. Uh, so yeah, this will just bring you to a Google uh, web store where you can download their, uh, the attachment. Uh, so yeah, get the tool. It's free on Chrome. Uh, so just click this. Uh, yeah, so you can see add to Chrome. I've already added to mine. Uh, so yeah, it should be removed from Chrome. But if you're just trying to set it up and you go to the uh, web store, you can just search it on Google as well without the link. Uh, just do something like Invid extension. And your second result, the result from the Chrome web store, click on it and you, you are able to add it to your browser. So basically when you add it to your browser, it will be in extensions, this, this corner here. I have a number of extensions, but you can see fake news debunker by Invid. So you can open it. Um, you can see open toolbox. Now, there's also one thing I need to point out. For a professional fact checker, you need to have Invid Premium. All right? So you can just request. If if you if you are using the free version or the basic version, you have limits. There are limitations to the amount of tools you can access. Uh, so just you know the request is something that will take you less than five minutes, and you know they'll grant the access. Whether you can prove that oh you need this thing for work, and uh, you can have it. All right. So uh, mainly, what we use it for is to do reverse image searches on keyframes. Like I explained earlier. Videos are worth a thousand pictures, and that's literally and metaphorically, uh, because basically a video is just a combination of plenty of pictures. So what Invid does is that it disintegrates the video and extracts the important keyframes, and you can now do reverse image searches on those keyframes and find out if they have been manipulated, if they have been altered, if they are fake and the like. So let's just uh, try an example. We have a sample video here. Uh, so this is from Ghana. Uh, it says MPP supporters are in the House of Parliament. Uh, you know, they are causing rancor and the like. So I just want to check if uh, the video is uh, accurate, if it's not manipulated, or if it's not a video from another part of the world uh, that was just passed off as something happening in Ghana. Because you see a lot of that. Videos from Nigeria, videos from Kenya, they will make their way into Ghana social media and uh, people will start passing them off as uh, from Ghana. They start saying, oh, this happened in Accra, this happened in this part of the country, this happened in this part of the country. So it's important that we're able to just quickly look at those videos and tell where they actually come from. So I'll just copy the link. You can download the video and upload, but now copying the link is more, much more convenient. And just come to keyframes, okay? And uh, you should ask us to put the link, uh, which I'll just do now, then you submit. So give it some time to process the, the videos, and bring out the images. You cannot do reverse image searches. So let's just let's just give some time. Yeah, this could take quite a while because it needs to process. But depending on the length of the video and how heavy it is, it should be done in a minute or two. I think uh, it's done now. Uh, so yeah, we have our results still loading. All right, now you can see pictures from that video that we just saw. Uh, you know, some of the important pictures, because it won't bring out all the pictures, all right? It's just go through the video, bring out the key details. Then you can now click on each of these individual images and now check them on Google. When you click them, automatically it takes it to Google search or Google Lens, uh, which is what is happening here. Okay. Then, just make sure it covers the entire frame. Now you can see this one saying Ogoni Youth and back on. Ogoni Youth is a Nigerian uh, youth group. So you can just now start checking each of the results individually and see which video matches uh, the one you saw. 
and compare the circumstances. So I think this video is actually uh, very, very accurate uh, from my checks. It doesn't look like that manipulated, but you can just go into these videos individually on YouTube, watch them. Uh, so this... Attention... Oh, sorry, YouTube wants to play ads. Uh, so let me just mute it. Okay. I uh, said, so of course, this is very, very different from what we saw. So this was just the first positive. Uh, you can look at the next one, Ghana Web. Uh, of course, this one is more likely to be relevant because this is from Ghana. Uh, so let me just look at the video. I think the page is still loading. Okay. Uh, so. uh, this one is from October. Uh, just last month and uh, it's a clash between police and some police. Oh, this is very loud uh, but of course it's also another false positive so you just keep looking at the videos and videos and videos and videos until you find the actual uh you know video that matches what you're looking for and sometimes you find videos that match but you see that the circumstances are different and that's a fact check right there and you can efficiently and effectively say, oh, this video is from Nigeria. I've checked this ballot box that was snatched, it's not you know, Ghana and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, this is basically it and what it does. Uh, so I have some exercises that we want us to just try out to make sure that we kind of understand these skills or how to use these tools. Uh, so this claim is from NPP Project Bureau. I know this is a political party page. And they say, oh, this is the newly constructed uh, Koforidua Sports Stadium in Ghana. All right. So what you want to make sure is just to do a resume search of this. I know you guys don't have access to the picture, so I'll just do it. So it's supposed to be an exercise. But I have more uh, coming on with that. So let me just let me just do this one. Okay. So once again, you go to image.google.com, uh, click on this, upload. This is the stadium. And, you know, uh, it says Koforida Sports Stadium. But so, no, I want to know if that is true. Uh, so this is a fact check by Kesa Check. But, but this is the or original image. You can see that it shares a lot of similarity with the fake one. Uh, this is from State House in Kenya. This image, okay. Uh, compare with this. Look at. Uh, it's kind of bent, but if you pay very close uh, attention, you see that they have a lot of similarities. And this is from Kenya. It says, uh, this is a like seven thousand five hundred capacity stadium built uh by the Kenyan government and stuff like that. So yeah, you can just tell that this picture is definitely not from Ghana. Uh, let's look at another result. So this is basically just the government of the day trying to pass the stadium as one of the achievements when in actual sense it is not. So yeah, yeah so this is the right image. Uh, it, it, it looks exactly like this, as you can see. As you can see. Then this is the Ulinzi Sports Complex in Kenya. All right. You can even see more information about this complex and when it was constructed and stuff like that. So yeah, when you see claims like this, you know that these are just government handlers trying to overstate their achievements and they are doing that by using fake images from other parts of the of the continent. Okay, uh, so this is definitely not from Ghana. This is definitely not an MPP project, and this is fake. All right. Uh, so the image itself is not altered, but it's misleading. It has been carried from another part of the. Uh, another part of the world, so to speak. And, you know, in fact, the hashtag they say building Ghana together. You know, this is that we're building. Uh, then another instance, you see fake cards. This is another exercise that I plan for us to do. Uh, I showed us one fake card earlier on about someone comparing hardship. I think Baumia saying that oh, if you compare the percentage of hardship, it was it was it's better under my administration. So yeah, you see a lot of fake cards like these tweets. So basically, to just capture stuff like this, uh, you might need to just go to the account, scroll, 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 scroll. You know, just do 
searches just to be able to uh, verify if they made the statement or not. So these are supposed to be true or false answers. So answer two. Now this third one. This is saying that uh, this is what we call public toilets. Big up A and A and C. The picture is very very funny at first glance uh, because a public toilet does not have to be this public. All right. Uh, it should at least have some form of enclosure. But yeah, this this is this is being touted to be constructed by the ANC government of South Africa. So as fact checkers, basically, you download the picture, you do reverse image searches, and you find the first use case. You find the first use case. So I know that you cannot answer true or false because you are not from South Africa. You don't know if it was indeed constructed by the ANC. Uh, but yeah, you can just do reverse image search. It should be like a personal exercise. It's not going to be graded. I'm, going, I'm not going to be there, but you know, when you get the slides, just try and verify which government constructed this kind of public toilets. Okay. Yeah. So, so far, so good. Any question? Maybe any area that's uh, it's not clear enough. Or oh, can I go on? Any questions, please? Okay. Okay, I can see the hand. Uh, how do you know the difference between uh, Fake news and deep, deep fake. Okay, so the difference between fake news and deep fake. Matters. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so fake news, so to speak. Uh, in fact, it's it's uh not, it's not an accurate language. Uh, it's it's mostly misinformation and disinformation, because news cannot be fake. Existentially, news cannot be fake. What is news? News is new information, All right? And it could be false, it could be accurate. So there's no such thing as fake news, so to speak. Because news is just new information. Information that doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the way you expect it. So mainly the accurate classification of these concepts is misinformation, disinformation, or malinformation, which were the concepts I covered at the introductory parts of this session. Okay. Uh, like I said, malinformation, information that is actually accurate but used with the intent to cause harm. Disinformation, false and deliberately created with the intention to cause harm. Then misinformation, false information, or uh, created not with the intent to cause harm. Now, deep fakes are alterations that look so real. Okay. Uh, especially now that we have AI, there are a lot of AI tools that when you see images from them, they look so original, they look so genuine, that it's very, very hard to spot. So those are deep fakes. There are videos that you see these days. That it is hard to spot. Uh, that you even mentioned it. I think I can. I can show you an example. Uh, the website called "This Person Does Not Exist" random face generator. And uh, um, so this thing can just generate random faces for you. You can say, "Oh, I want a female who is uh, a teenager." Who is probably black and click on refresh and you know in a matter of seconds the tool gives you oh this is even wrong but it gives you something that is so hard to spot so if i say oh what is wrong with this image does this look real you probably say yes i can create a fake social media account with this this particular one it's not good but you can just refresh and get another one so yeah these are these are examples of deep fakes Images that don't exist. In fact, the website is called this person does not exist.com. But it's very, very hard to spot. So these are deep fakes. Uh, why, why fake news as we call it is misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. And uh, that will bring us. Huh? We have another question. Hi, both. Yeah. But what I want to know is how we can marry that with getting the public to know that what they are seeing is misinformation or any of those things, whether it's a deep fake. Or otherwise, how do we help? Because on one end, we're doing our job, but how do we get the people who are also getting fed with information to leave it? 
And I'm asking this because sometimes the misinformation goes out and it's widespread. By the time you fact check, maybe just a handful of people can even get to see it or appreciate it or even want to believe it that it's actually um, a misinformation that went out earlier. So how do you balance the two of doing the work of a fact checker and as well as ensuring that you are diffusing the misinformation that's going out? Okay. Okay, Martin. All right. Yeah, I think uh, I can relate to what he's saying. I know that uh, as journalists, we also have responsibilities, especially during this election period. It's a busy time. Uh, on election day, you're also covering the elections, and uh, you probably don't have the time, you don't have the uh, resources to you know, start fact-checking on the go. So usually what we advise is to have dedicated fact-check desks uh, that are solely focused on identifying misinformation and debunking it. Uh, because it's hard to combine it with traditional reporting. Uh, you are trying to, you know, observe the process. Hi. Report we can hardly hear you. Can you um, take it again? Okay, I believe you can hear me clearly now. Hello, can you hear me now? And... Hi, Martin. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, is there anyone on the any any other person on the call uh hearing me? Because I can see you guys clearly. Buttons, but can you hear me? Surprised. Yeah, I can hear you. This internet is okay. Can you guys hear me? Uh, let me just write just a text. Yeah, I'm surprised because it shouldn't be my internet. And I can also see the video clearly. So I'm assuming it's probably just audio issues and not internet issues. The video to the room is muted as well. The audio is muted. Oh, that could be the problem. Yeah. Martin, uh, can you should... hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So um, if you can take your answer again, because we didn't hear you at all. All right. Uh, I, I mentioned that I understand how difficult it can be uh, to combine your responsibilities as a reporter with fact-checking, especially during the election period, uh, because it, these are busy periods. You know, uh, you have a lot going on. On election day, you are covering the process, uh, trying to monitor the conduct. So basically, what we advise is to have dedicated fact-checkers and set up a fact-check desk whose primary responsibility is just fighting misinformation. You can't be on the field and you know start looking out for fake news and trying to debunk it. Uh, in fact, you you will not be able to do it efficiently, and uh, you can uh, make mistakes, and that's even worse uh, because mistakes in fact checks are not forgivable. When you say something is a fact check, it means that you are saying that you have done extensive checks and you are declaring the information to be false. So if you are assuming to say, oh, what this person has said is false, uh, you are making yourself an arbiter of the truth. So you should not make mistakes. So it's not something you can do on the field. So basically, you need a dedicated fact check there that can undo that. Who have the competencies, the tools, resources, and you know they don't have to worry. They don't have to worry about uh, what is happening. They can just focus solely on uh, what is false, what is misleading, what is manipulated, and just uh, probably just uh, fight that. Yeah. So uh, it's difficult to do it on the field, uh, but as much as you can, your newsroom. Uh, that's what it takes. We encourage uh, that you have a dedicated fact check desk. Yeah, I know a number of fact check organizations in Ghana uh, that are solely for fact checking. So organizations like that are in the best position to fact check. But the best you can do as a journalist, if you see something that you believe to be manipulated, you can report so that this thing does not continue going viral. You can nip it in the bud. You can cut it short before 
and more people see. So you don't just look at it and say, oh, this is fake, and just keep scrolling. Okay. As much as you find anything that is fake, anything that is manipulated, anything that is false, you have a deep, you have a to report to these platforms. It is the very best you can do, uh, or the very least you can do if you can't fact check, right? Uh, so simple reporting. It might take a number of people to report before the platform take action, but at least you have done your part. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question and we can move to the final uh, part of this presentation, uh, which is about social media monitoring. Um, Martins, before you uh, move you on, you just, have... one just one. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, Chief. Okay, as a journalist. Okay, so um, he's asking what is the first thing to do when you spot fake news as a journalist? Uh, you have to first verify if it is fake news uh, because sometimes you can also be wrong. You should not assume that it is fake news. There are some things that you see at a glance based on your level of media literacy and you know probably from attending trainings like this, you know it is false. So one, you have to very, uh, you have to check, you have to be very sure that oh, this is false. So basically, what we advise or what you should do is to write a fact check, and after writing the fact check, you can now report, or you can even report before writing the fact check. But make sure you write a fact check and you report uh, that that misinformation that you come across. Yeah, so that that's just uh, that's the best you can do because the fact check will always be there for posterity's sake. I know sometimes it will not go as viral as the misinformation because when people post uh, false information, it has thousands of views. But when you write a fact check, it only has hundreds. But at least you have done your part as a journalist. It's, it's left for the platform. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I can't see any other hands, uh, so I'll proceed. So quickly, how do you monitor social media? for its speech, for disinformation, for misinformation during elections. Uh, so the first thing is some of the trends that you are going to see, and I'm very sure uh, you're probably uh, taking note of this since already. In the build-up to elections, a lot of TV stations will have duplicates. For instance, uh, these examples I have here, TV3 in Ghana, you see plenty of accounts. Joy News, plenty of accounts. Daily Guide, plenty of accounts. GH1 TV. So you see a lot of media imitations, okay? And some of these fake accounts are set up for the sole purpose of misleading people. Uh, you know, they tweet, they post, and uh, some people will think, oh, this is the authentic uh, account of these media platforms and tend to believe whatever they see on this uh, propaganda account, but they are fake. So you are going to see a lot of media imitations. Apart from even media, you, guys, you are going to see a lot of political actors with plenty of accounts. So it's important that you know we know how to verify them. I'm still going to go into that. Uh, beyond that, you see amplification. Uh, they are always packaged in giveaways, um, mostly on X on Twitter. Oh, retweet this for uh, 100 CDs a time. Retweet this uh, to participate in a raffle draw. You know they offer rewards, rewards to amplify a message. They will tell you that oh, tweet this keyword, tweet Baumia. Let's, you know, let's pick 10 winners, stuff like that. So you're, you're going to see a lot of amplification and uh, they are trying to just manually make this thing go viral. And the way the social media algorithms work, uh, they look at how many people are talking about a certain keyword and, you know, they keep pushing it. They keep pushing it. So uh, they, are, they are aware of this technique and, you know, they're always trying to amplify uh, with some fake rewards. Then another thing is memes. Uh, we are in an era where everything is, you know, Everything is mimified, and you know, people people love things that are funny. Now you can see something that is funny that is misleading. I know it is misleading. Some people might see it and think it is accurate. All right, they are saying that if satire is not understood, it becomes misinformation. If something is a satire, is a satirical piece, and a lot of people are misled, then it's misinformation. So some of these political posts they will disguise themselves as memes. They will be like jokes. They will be like funny content. And you know, people love funny content. Funny content goes viral. Uh, so anytime you see people weaponizing satire, weaponizing memes, uh, just make sure that uh, you uh, put it, you clear the hair you, for the record so that people know that, oh, this, this thing is satire. And this is... On, on April Fool's Day, there was an incident that happened. It's, it's not political, but 
Uh, there was a rumor that Davido was arrested in Kenya. And on the website that spread that information, they labeled it as satire. They put it directly under the headline that this is satire, it's April Fool's Day. But people kept sharing it. It started trending on Twitter. People started believing it. And, you know, the artist had to come out to debunk it. But it was satire in the first place. But a lot of people would miss it. Uh, so anytime you see things like this, especially during political uh, campaign periods, uh, just make sure that uh, you kind of clear the air, you write a fact check that, oh, this thing is false, it's a satire, uh, it's a meme, you know, stuff like that, so so that people understand. Now, uh, this brings us to imposter pages. Most of these accounts, you you not see authentic accounts engaging in, in this kind of things. Sometimes some people do it, but more often than not, they set up fake accounts, fake social media profiles, you know, uh, where they mislead people. In the example I showed about imitating media, you saw a lot of TV3 accounts. All these accounts are fake. So how do you verify? How do you know which account is authentic? All right? So on Facebook, one of the best ways is to use Facebook transparency. Of course, there are other methods you can use to check. You can look at the tone. Uh, if, if an account says, oh, this is the account of uh, President or Vice President Baumia, and you see them promising giveaways. You see them tweeting in certain languages. You know that, oh, this, this can be, all right? You know that uh, these people are professionals handling their pages. Uh, they can't tweet in this crass manner. Uh -huh. So there are other ways. You can look at the tone used, some of the images shared. Uh, but one of the very, very important tools that Facebook has developed for us to be able to check this efficiently is called Facebook page transparency. So for instance, this particular page is a political party page, National Democratic Congress. About 36,000 followers. And you know, they tweet a lot of things. Uh, you just you scroll, you find a lot of information. But if you just come to about here, then you come to pay transparency. Uh, you see when it was created, 2020, this, uh, 2010 rather, December. Uh, you can read more. Now you look at history. Now when it was created, the account name was initially Presidency of the Republic of Ghana. Then at some point, about five years later, it changed to National Democratic Congress. And you know, uh, these are just clues that some of these accounts, they had different purposes in the, in, 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 at the onset. So when you see a lot of name changes, name changes, name changes, you see an account that was supporting a position uh, of this party, it just suddenly changed names. You know, it's another thing. You just... To tell you that this is fake. So this thing cannot transition from being the presidency account to a political party's account. All right. And on Facebook, you can even look at verification mark. Most of these accounts, in fact, let me search National Democratic Congress. You'll find out that they have a verified, a verified page, which is this one, with about 70k followers, just uh, a bit more than the fake account. So yeah, just look at some of these things. And if you can come here. You can come to about, look at the pay transparency created in 2012. And you know, there has been no name change. So it was created as National Democratic Congress. It is still National Democratic Congress. And you know, people that manage that are also from Ghana. There are sometimes that when you're investigating pages, you see a page that is talking about Ghana politics, for instance, NDP, MPP. And you see people managing it from Finland, from Russia, from Nigeria. So you know that these are fake accounts that are created to mislead. Uh, to create this information around the elections. So this is just one of the fail safe ways to verify Facebook pages. Now, it's a different ball game on Twitter. One, verification on Twitter now has a price tag. Unlike in the past, that uh, only authentic accounts are verified, accounts of public figures, uh, politicians, celebrities, and all. Now on Twitter for $8, anybody can buy a verified account. When I searched the Electoral Commission on Ghana on Twitter, I found about five results. And, you know, how do you know which of these accounts is the actual authentic account? All right. So basically, it's hard to use verification as a yardstick. Anybody can be verified. Uh, but one other important thing that you can do is go to the authentic websites of the Electoral Commission of Ghana. Then try and look at the social media handles from there. So basically, uh, what I did, Electoral Commission of, sorry, 
of Ghana. So this is the official website, uh, and you can see .gov.gh, uh, which is one of the pointers that this is the official account, an official account of the government. You can just scroll, and you can see connect with us on Twitter, and it will bring you to the actual uh, account, uh, which is uh, the account of the Electoral Commission of Ghana, which, which has authentic information about the elections. All these other ones here, they are fake. And they are going to mislead people. They are going to you are, you are going to see them post results during election in real time, and these results are not going to be trustworthy. Uh, yeah, so it's hard to use uh, the verification check mark, but the best way is to contact the uh, the people, the people involved, uh, the commission. Go to the commission's website and just look at it. Then sometimes you can also check the date of creation. For instance, this has been created since twenty fifteen, about nine years now. He has uh, about 220,000 followers. So if you see an account that was created last month that joined, let's say, October 2024, you know that this one is just created with the intention of misleading people, okay? So you can just use some of these clues to know if this account is authentic or not. Uh, yeah, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. I have an exercise, uh, which I think we should go into uh, shortly. I don't know if I still have the time. Well, yeah, any question? So as a media personality, how can you fight these fake accounts on social media? Honestly, you can't fight them. You can only do your best. Uh, platforms like Twitter, for instance, they are always reluctant to take down accounts that are verified because these people are paying for the verification. So it's a business at the end of the day. Uh, but you can report, you can fact check to probably just try and help other people know that this is fake. But the account themselves, uh, there's, lim there's limits to what you can do. On Facebook, you can also report. And these things are automated. So, some of these platforms don't have dedicated people reviewing these reports. So basically what you just have uh, uh, bots, you know, automated, and they won't take action. In fact, before you see any serious action, it has to be mass reported. It has to be reported by a lot of people. So what you can do as a journalist is just to fact check it and try and educate people that this is fake. All right. Sometimes you might not be able to take it down. For that okay any okay okay so I think is to the official numbers so um, the audience I able to identify the numbers that you can easily reach out to that's much easier that if they can spot out the other um handles that exist so they know that okay when it comes to this media organization this is the name that they use across the social media platform because there is uniformity. Because we see on the other platform, X will have one um, profile name. We go to a different account on Facebook has a different profile name. But if you have a consistent uniform name across all your social media platforms, that would be one way to, to spot the fakes. And it would be easier for your audience to know that if I'm looking for this organization, I'm looking for this name across all the platforms. Yeah, okay. I, I agree Thanks. with him. But sometimes it can be difficult to uh, get consistency in the names. Uh, for instance, you might have a username on Instagram. And when you go to register Twitter, you discover that it has been taken. And there are even some bad actors that they look at your username on Instagram and they maliciously go and register it on Twitter. It happens to a platform like Binance. Uh, people registered. The moment they see that, oh, this is becoming big, they go and register those accounts with those handles. Yeah, but what you said makes a lot of sense, just that sometimes uh, it can be difficult to achieve. Yeah, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll recommend that. Okay, we have another question here. It's more like a suggestion. suggestion. Okay. So um, for Twitter or X, there are 10 before affiliated accounts, right? So if you look at Elon Musk, yeah. his Twitter, you can see the verified, but you also see like X, the organization X, 
and look to it. So I think maybe some organizations can look at how they can get these activated uh, out so that they can first verify maybe even if it's their staff, their other affiliated accounts. So for example, let's say in multimedia, they have Joy FM, Joy TV, all of those things. They can all cross-verify them and then affiliate them together to say that, oh, yes, this is multimedia. And this is Joy FM verified, but it is affiliated to multimedia. So that if somebody goes to buy another Joy FM account, and there's no affiliation, you can be able to easily detect that this is uh, not affiliated to the multimedia joint on Yeah, that's correct. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a good one. But, you know, it comes back to the commercialization of the platform uh, because to even have affiliations, I think you need to be on the gold plan. And these things are not one-off payments. They are monthly subscriptions. And uh, I don't know about the exchange rates in Ghana, uh, but a media house in Nigeria will probably not want to subscribe for uh, this these expensive gold badges just you know uh, to be able to convince people that you are credible because the media itself is probably not even as sustainable as that. But yeah, in, in an ideal world, that would make a lot of sense. But uh, it's already commercial. And what is even stopping a bad actor from also buying a good good badge and you know see, creating affiliations of fake profile so uh, it, it's just quite difficult now and uh, it leaves us to intuition so like i said you can look at the tone the tone of the messages look at the posts one you can look at the account creation date when was the account created uh, if it's recent it might not be authentic there are that it could be but there's a very, very high chance that it's not you can just look at the tone the messages uh a credible media platform what are they tweeting what are they posting? Are you seeing obscene images? Are you seeing, uh, you know, memes? Are you seeing irrelevant posts? So you can just use that to also uh, evaluate the authenticity of these accounts. But yeah, thank you very much for that. Any other question? Okay. Okay, so he is asking a very interesting question. So he's saying that um, as journalists, you, you fight misinformation that have been created by AI tools, but are there any AI tools that can also fight these AI generated misinformation, you know, tools? Yeah, yeah, you definitely have to use AI to fight AI. Uh, I showed us one of the tools that people can use to create fake accounts. Uh, I did not. Let me just see if I can just uh, give an example. Uh, one of the very extensions I use is called Hive AI Detector. I don't know if you can see it on my screen. Uh, you can just search Hive AI extension. Uh, so uh, attach it to. Add it to your Chrome. Then anytime you see an image, you can just check. You just right click and click on hide. Uh, let me just see if I can demo that in one minute. Okay. So this is the image. This person does not exist. Of course, this image is here generated, uh, even though it looks perfect. So I'll just download it for free uh, because it's also monetized. Uh, virtually everything now. You have to pay to get it. Yeah. So I'll just use this image. I'll, I'll share the link uh, with the organizers later. Uh, but yeah, you can use it to check if something is here generated. Um, I'm still trying to download the picture. Uh, but while I do that, if there are more questions, I think I can take them. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, it doesn't seem like there are questions, but uh, I might need to restart my uh, device okay. to do that. So I'll just stop sharing for a minute. Uh, restart my browser, rather, not device. Okay. Um, in the meantime, do we have any other question? No question. We're going for a snack break in six minutes. You have six minutes to ask questions. Uh, so I'm sharing my screen again. Uh, I refreshed, so this should work now. Let's have some invasive. Yeah, so basically you see this icon. When you install Ive on your browser, anywhere you go, you see this icon. You can move it around. Uh, even if you come to X, the icon is there. So you can just click on it. Uh, you can text, you can verify text. If it's um if if it's text, you can copy it here, then you can upload the image. Uh, the image I just downloaded is this. Then you can just click on check origin. Uh, so these AI tools can also give you false positives, but this particular one from experience uh, really works well. Uh, so this one, it has a verdict already. It says this is 98.2% likely to be AI generated. All right. So anytime you just uh, come across here, this is one of the very best tools that you can use. Uh, it's called Hive. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, so the group exercise, I don't know if it's going to be after the lunch break. We had intended that uh, we go into four groups and just uh, verify some claims that are found. And these claims are from Ghana. Uh, so yeah, there are things that uh, people already seen. Uh, let me open all four of them. Uh, but yeah, is it going to be after lunch, uh, after breakfast? So yes, Martins, we'll, we'll do that after uh, the snack break. All right, all right, brilliant. Yeah, so I think uh, we can go for the snacks. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Bye for now. Okay, let's all clap for Martins. I think you're gonna. So, thank you so much, Martins and we'll be back okay so kindly hold all right on. yeah i will be here okay. thank you you guys should probably also send me a virtual ghanaian breakfast uh <laughs> probably not gonna join off or anything else <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Purpose project encompasses about three or four activities. The first of which we are doing right now, which is the media trade, keeping you with how to combat misinformation and also, we are in an election year. The issue of peace always comes comes up. So, as a team, we decided to do a peace campaign video with selected stakeholders in Ghana. So, my colleague will be playing the uh, trailer for you, especially during the week on our socials. And then, I know the Wikimedia family is here. As you all know, after election day, we'll be converging here for uh, editathon, not a hackathon. Editathon, to be precise, right? Basically, updating the uh, election data and profiles of uh, various personalities. Then, I think the final one is we'll also be doing election observation. As we go vote, we'll also be taking pictures with our community members. And so that when you vote, you can take pictures to highlight whatever is going on in your constituency or everywhere. I'm particularly about Bantama results. So I'll be going to Bantama too. Look at that, but these are the activities under the Ghana Post project. And I'll encourage you guys to watch our space, our socials, 
and that of code for Africa, Wikimedia User Ghana, and Wikimedia Foundation. Watch that space. So thank you very much. And so my colleague will play the audio right now. Play the trailer. Are we are we all ready for the trailer? Okay, so yeah. Let's start again. Has committed to documenting the most accurate and valuable information on the branches inside the Kibina. Which is what I think we did about 2024. Forget to remind every Ghanaian that the great information, as well as the information is information, plays a huge part in maintaining the peace of our country. One of the goals I noticed is point of view of journalists in putting out their voices in the United States. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, we are going straight into the next session. So, Martins, if you can hear me, we are ready for you. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your breakfast. Uh, so for the group exercises, I'll just uh, quickly explain. Uh, then we can do that later. So I have four exercises here, which are four claims that we can fact check. Uh, so basically, we're going to four groups, and each group produce uh, not necessarily a fact check. Just look at the claim. Uh, verify then just report your findings. I don't expect you to start writing a fact check, but just tell me to find what is wrong. Uh, so this is the first one. It's a digital card. Uh, we will not allow Dr. Bahumia to implement the free dialysis in December. Uh, why didn't he do it in the last seven years? So just make sure that did this account of made the statements. Just try and verify that. Uh, the next one here is a recharge card. Uh, 50 Ghana cities at time. Uh, for MPP. So just try and verify the image. Is the party running a campaign like this? Uh, the next one is another digital card. It says, shut up in your wheelchair. You go to jail when my hammer is on him. Uh, try and verify this. Is it accurate? Uh, is it correct? And lastly, uh, the last one says, and this is Della Edem apologizes to Kufo after this of public backlash. Like I said, I know this has been training for quite a while. Uh, so just try and verify if indeed he has apologized uh, for the statements that was credited to him. Yeah, so we'll probably do that later. I just wanted to kind of explain. Uh, so thank you for your attention so far. I think I'll be dropping off now and hand it to Nathan. Uh, I'm very, very confident that we'll still have uh, more interactions in the not so distant future. Uh, once again, I uh, thank you for your attention and bye for now. Nathan, hey, Matos, do you hear that? Do you hear all the applause? I did not hear, but I can see it. Uh, oh, thank you. Guys. Really <laughs> do you hear? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. Thank you, guys. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much, Martins. And this has been very insightful. So um, to the projects or the assignments that uh, Martins was speaking about, what we are going to do after this session is that we are going to create one WhatsApp group. That's if you would want us to. 
right? You are going to create the WhatsApp group and we are going to um, group all of you into four, just so you identify the disinformation or the um, things that the information that are not true on the images that he just presented to us, right? So this is just an engagement strategy after the session. Who here is down for that? Before we actually create the WhatsApp group, because we do not want to create the WhatsApp group and then we will not be feeling like you guys are engaged. So please, if you are down for this, kindly say I. Okay, then the eyes have it. Thank you so much. So we are going to create the WhatsApp group. So um, to proceed, we have um, Nathan from the Wikimedia Foundation, and he is going to uh, present on a topic that's very, very, very interesting. I know most of us here have the perception that Wikipedia is not what's credible. Now we have an expert from the Wikimedia Foundation. Let's see how you know, we can combat this myth and then how exactly it can help us in the general elections. I mean, how your reportage will be factful or not, right? So I'm going to leave it for Nathan to introduce himself, then take it from there. So Nathan, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for having me. Um, it, um, it is really lovely to be here. Um, there's not only me here from the Wikimedia Foundation, there's also my colleague, Abigail, who um, I'll get to introduce herself in, in a moment. Um, to give you a bit of background into who I am and uh, the work that we do, um, I sit within the trust and safety function at the Wikimedia Foundation we work to try and make sure that editors of Wikipedia are as safe um, and free to uh, contribute their knowledge as possible um, wherever they are in the world, including Ghana in the, in the run-up to the elections. Um, my specific role is as a disinformation specialist, so I frequently work with editing communities, civil society organisations, um, and also journalists, um, to try and make sure that the the information that we find on on Wikipedia is as high quality as possible. Um, today we're going to have a um, a presentation about our work in combating disinformation. But first, I'll I'll um, invite Abigail to introduce herself as well. Okay, hi everyone. Um, can can everyone hear me? I'm worried about the sound. My name is Abigail. I'm so sorry I cannot be on video. The internet connection where I'm at right now is very, very bad. Um, but my uh, my name is Abigail. I am also a senior trust and safety specialist at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I also work on the trust and safety team with Nathan. So Nathan works on the disinformation side, but I also um, work on the policy side where I lead all of our policy work and collaborate with our community of editors and volunteers to develop and update uh, content and platform policies um, to protect users, our editors, um, um, and just users all over the world, and as well as preserving the integrity of our platforms, um, which is not only Wikipedia, but also several open um, source products and platforms. And yeah, I'm very excited to be here. I know many of you have, um, there are so many other things that you could have been using your time to do this time for, but I um, really appreciate you joining us for this session and um, we're excited to talk about this topic. Yeah, so um, let's jump in. Um, what I will do is I will share my screen, which has a presentation. Um, make sure I can do that. Can everybody see our presentation here? Yes. Yes, yes, we can. Super, super. Okay, let's let's dive in. Um, so um, the kind of focus of our presentation is um, our battle against disinformation. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in from a wide angle onto the 2024 Ghana elections. Um, I'll pass over to Abigail to introduce um, how this works. Sure. Um, so yeah, just like um, Nathan said, 
Um, today we are um, just to you know to go over what the main discussion points for today. We'll first start from a high level to discuss Wikipedia and its role within the you know the wider information ecosystem, and then we'll zoom in to discuss how disinformation manifests and looks differently on Wikipedia, and then we'll also share some examples of um, anti disinformation projects, and then. Even zooming further, which, you know, the main reason why many of you are here today um, to discuss all of this within the context of the, the Ghana elections, um, which is coming up on um, 7th December. So to start, um, I, I know we have a lot of people from the media attending today. And we wanted to highlight, you know, um, the specific role of the media in the wider information ecosystem and then um, uh, but just just to, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody here knows um, what Wikipedia is, but just to ensure we have a baseline of understanding, um, it is an online, um, is an, it is an online encycl encyclopedia, excuse me, which is open and accessible to everyone globally and often used um, as a source of information. Um, but for Wikipedia, and you know, the other um, open source platforms and products to work and be effective, we need the media. Uh, Wikipedia, for example, has a verifiability policy, which means that people are able to check that where information is coming from and making sure that it's coming from a reliable and a credible source. Um, so to ensure that its, con its content is determined by previously published information rather than editors' beliefs and experiences. So that means that, you know, not, no, not, not everybody can just come on Wikipedia and put anything there, which is just, you know, their opinion or their independent um, voice or thoughts, or it's not, it's not an opinion piece. Um, There we go. Hi, Nathan. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think you might have lost Abigail. Oh, okay, sorry. Can you? Oh, Abigail's saying. Ah, yeah. Here we are. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, my God. Where did you lose me? Okay. Um, where did we lose Abigail? We were talking sources, I think. Sources. Okay. Um. Let me see. So... Okay, just to, um, I think, so what I was saying initially was that if uh, um, you cannot just come on Wikipedia and put, you know, your independent opinion or um, thought or just like some, something you, you think um, is true on Wikipedia, um, even if you're sure something is true, it must have been previously published in a reliable source before you can add it. Um, and if reliable sources, even sometimes because this happens, if reliable sources disagree with each other, um, then you have to maintain a neutral point of view and present what the various sources say, given each side is due weight. And so the media researchers and journalists heavily influence content on Wikipedia. Um, so the more news that um, you all are able to cover and investigate, the more we are able to create even more content on Wikipedia and have um, the, the breadth and um, of the information and also cover more topics and issues. Um, secondly, I think the, um, the, we, the media has a, a very important role of fact checking um, and ensuring, you know, that there's accurate reports and media outlets, you know, um, have their own processes internally, such as like verifying um, facts before publishing, ensuring that, you know, the news that you share is accurate to prevent the spread of false narratives. And another way that I think the media also does um, does this is also by debunking um, disinformation or false news by countering it with like um, with facts and original news and news sources. And then I think there's a final piece of um, contributing to like digital literacy and raising awareness, um, which involves, you know, highlighting some of the, the threads, like literally what we're doing here, you know, having these conversations on your platforms um, and talking about disinformation, what it is, how it exists um, and all of that and educating the public about the dangers of disinformation, because I think normally um, there, there is always like disinformation and then how it spreads, you, usually there will be a bad actor who would deliberately 
um, want to um, e um, sit somewhere and issue like a false narrative, but it also spreads through misinformation where there are people who normally wouldn't verify some of the, the sources or information and just like just keep sharing and spreading that out and on, on WhatsApp or social media and, you know, many other platforms. So I think um, connecting that's even digital literacy, the more people are aware of some of the the signals, the the tricks, the tools that bad actors use to spread false information, the, the easier they're able to identify it and um, also spread um, uh, and also mitigate the spread of such content. Um, okay, the um, can you move to the next slide, Nathan? So as with every good thing, um, there are always threats. And um, since Wikipedia is such a, a really big player in the information ecosystem, there are, of course, threats and bad actors always trying to find creative ways to destroy the platform's integrity. Um, and first, I think maybe to define disinformation, because I'm, I'm not, you know, to ensure that we all have a baseline of understanding. So it's, it is basically um, false or inaccurate information, um, especially the type of false information that is deliberately intended to deceive. So the, um, the difference between disinformation and like misinformation and other forms are just like the intents for disinformation. There is a de very deliberate intention. Um, whereas for like misinformation and other um other for and like malinformation for example is also another type, the the intention um sometimes there is no clear intention um or there is not a very deliberate intention. So I just wanted to establish that. Um, so disinfo often starts with like um disinformation. Sorry, often starts with like unreliable information or um, news sources or somebody, um, not necessarily like a news source, but just like there's always a source. Somebody sitting somewhere creating, whether it's like using AI to create like um, a video or an audio or if it's like an article or, you know, it's, there is always like um, that intention and somebody sitting somewhere to like really execute this and having like an action plan. And then, or so, and sometimes, you know, that is, that comes from like news sources, which then spreads across platforms, including Wikipedia. So if there are unreliable news sources or false news sources, um, that affects the content that we have on Wikipedia, because like I, um, I said earlier, um, new, the media plays a major role where um, on Wikipedia, you know, you always have to have a source for whatever you're putting there on the platform. So if sources are unreliable or sources are false, the information that's also going to be on Wikipedia is also going to be false. Um, so it is important that I think, you know, especially in the media, like um, disinformation is just really targeted and mitigated at the source to prevent it from spreading and going onto other platforms like um wikipedia because um when it gets on wikipedia it also affects like the entire e information ecosystem such as you know like people using wikimedia um wikipedia data for research or education and all the different ways that it's used that it really affects it and then it really you know keeps spreading like cancer um uh yeah we can go to the next slide okay so um abigail set the scene for us a little bit in terms of how asian ecosystem and um i think a lot of the, the the things she touched on were were similar to what martin's was focusing on um earlier this morning i'm now going to zoom in a little bit um, to think about Wikipedia as a as a platform, um, Martin's was speaking a lot this morning, and some of the fact checks that he's he's left with with you there in the room um, are focused quite heavily on social media. Um, the first thing to say, I think, is that um, we do suffer from disinformation attacks on Wikipedia, um, but it looks a little bit different from how you are used to seeing these things. So the um, the specific uh, examples that Martins was sharing oh. about uh, about yeah, Abby, uh, any yes hello hello hi hi Nathan yeah we lost you okay 
Shall we, we start from the beginning of this? Okay, cool. Yeah. I will start from the beginning of this uh, slide again. So um, as Abigail set the scene, I'm now going to zoom in a little bit uh, to focus on uh, Wikipedia as a as a as a platform. Um, the first thing to say, I suppose, is that um, disinformation attacks do happen on Wikipedia. Um, they look a little bit different from. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, Nathan, uh, Martin, I can hear you clearly. I think okay. uh, there's a problem with the internet at the venue. Okay. Because uh, I'm just thinking to learn about Wikipedia as well, and I've not had any issue with your audio or your video. Okay. Thanks for clarifying, Martin. Okay, so thank okay. you. For people in the uh, uh, other venue, let us know if they can hear. Um, you yeah, like? this strikes me as a venue problem. Hello? Can you hear us now? Um, right, feel um, like if oh. you're talking, you're and muted. You can you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I can hear you now. Can you? Hello. Can you hear? Can you hear us properly? Yes, yes, yes. Nathan, we can hear you. We can hear you now. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, we can hear us clearly. So. Hear us clearly now? now. Okay, okay. Then oh, we can go on. Okay. Cool. I will um, start from the beginning of, of this section again. Um, so Abigail has set the scene a little bit um in terms of wikipedia's relationship with the wide information ecosystem i'm going to zoom in a little bit to talk about zoom in a little so just like information attacks uh, rudely cut me off <laughs> um Disinformation attacks look a little bit different on Wikipedia than they look on social media. Um, and there are a few reasons for this. The first reason is the community. So the community of editors on Wikipedia leads the way in every aspect of our work. Um, those community members have a vested interest in um, stopping dis disinformation from manifesting um, on their projects. Secondly, the, the platform um, is built in such a way that there is friction in the system. So rather than, as you imagine on social media, thousands of different opinions on a topic, Wikipedia aims to, based on the best verifiable resources on one page each per topic folks other than using technical and finally the the, the guidelines of, of wikipedia are helpful here so as abigail was mentioning before there are the guidelines around verifiability and note here Um, on a given topic and crucially without a verifiable source to back it up and the final thing and this is this is uh, where probably wikipedia differs from a lot of the um a lot of the news outlets that that folks work for um wikipedia is not a newspaper so 
the value of this is that it doesn't attempt to provide up to the minute reporting to cover everything that's happening in the world. It gives us a chance at a kind of second draft of history. So there is value in kind of taking time to assure that the information which is being added is accurate, verifiable from a neutral point of view and includes no original research. Which makes reliable resources um, all the more important. So this is what um, English language Wikipedia's um, rules on verifiability state regarding reliable sources. Um, so, sorry, state reg regarding questionable sources. Um, they know that um, questionable sources are those that have a poor reputation for checking the facts, lack meaningful editorial oversight, or have an apparent conflict of interest. Um, such sources include websites and publications expressing views that are widely considered by other sources to be extremist or promotional, um. or that rely heavily on unsubstantiated gossip, rumour and personal opinion. Nathan, I think. Uh, can folks still hear me? Can folks still hear me in the room? I suspect the answer to that is no. Yeah, I really wonder what's going on. Um, I also, I think they are muted. So if they are trying to talk to ones here. Okay, so we are we are experiencing some fluctuations from our end. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Um, I think the last time you were on, you were you had the previous slide. Kindly go back to the previous slide. Okay. Which section? Yes. So you are on the guidelines. Guidelines. Yeah. Guidelines. Okay. Yes. Super. Thank you. Um. So as I was saying, the um. The ways that disinformation manifests has to has to go through these slightly different bureaucratic pro processes than the way it manifests on um, on Twitter, on Facebook, on other social media platforms. So the guidelines are really useful here. Um, they're useful because we we search for verifiability in any piece of content that's added to the platform. We search for a neutral point of view, which means that. All of the val valid resources on a given topic should be included, um, given their due weight. Um, and we search for no original research. So any piece of content added should not um, be someone's point of view, as Abigail was saying, but rather um, based on um, a published reliable resource um, that can be used as a source. And finally, it's kind of important to note here that, and, and this is where I think Wikipedia can be really valuable is that Wikipedia is not a newspaper. So as an encyclopedia, it doesn't aim to pro provide up to the minute reporting and, and cover everything that's happening in the world at that very moment. But there's an opportunity to take a step back. Um, and I think this is something that folks um, will get involved in in the editathon following the election and provide a crucial kind of second draft of history. So um, they can focus on the on the sources that have been published um, around uh, the election process, um, step back and build an article from the sources that exist um, that focus on not being a newspaper, that focus on being an encyclopedia instead. Now, there are some sources which are not uh, considered reliable sources on Wikipedia. This is the rule from the English language Wikipedia on verifiability. Um, and this quote is about questionable sources, circular sources, or self-published sources. So this rule says, questionable sources are those that have a poor reputation for checking the facts, lack meaningful editorial oversight, or have an apparent conflict of interest. 
Such sources include websites and publications expressing views that are widely considered by other sources to be extremist or promotional, or that rely heavily on unsubstantiated gossip, rumor, or personal opinion. So this is where reliably sourced news becomes an integral part of how a Wikipedia article is built. Now, to move slightly to uh, the work that um, myself and Abigail do at the foundation, because of because Wikipedia is slightly different from these social media platforms, we have to think about disinformation in a slightly different way. And so we we kind of abide by this ABC of disinformation uh, frame. So when I first um, worked in trust and safety, the massive, massive focus was on content. So uh, YouTube um, used to employ masses and, ma and still do employ masses of community moderators who focus exclusively on content. Now, content for the Wikimedia Foundation is not something that we touch. This is purely in the realm of the editing community. And so our teams focus primarily on behaviors related to disinformation. So what does the network look like that is sharing this information? Um, what kinds of accounts do they use? What kind of account names do they use? What kind of practices do they employ on the platform? And then we also look at actors. So we look beyond the Wikimedia ecosystem towards the wider uh, media ecosystem in a given country. So in Ghana, for, for example, we'd be looking beyond Wikimedia to um, the, the kind of juicy political stories of the day. Um, and we try and link those actors and that behavior back to the content that we're seeing on the platform. Now, in terms of the work that um, the disinformation team does, um, we're just one part of the puzzle um, in terms of uh, the work that goes into anti-disinformation work at the Wikimedia Foundation. And there's a whole network of actors um, who come together to support our quest for reliable, verified content. So you can see our team up here in the, in the top right-hand side, um, we work on things like behavioral investigations, as I said, focusing on behavior research, focusing on actors and community support. So providing that that on the ground support to editors who are facing um, particular trouble. We work closely with our human rights team um, and our legal team um, who ensure that everything we do is is above board and ensure that the the help that we can offer to anyone anywhere in the world who wants to edit Wikipedia um, is available. We work with um, our public policy folks um, to try and ensure that um, the model that we've set up um, at Wikipedia is um, still able um, to function regardless of the of the jurisdiction that that's in. So we, we fight against bad regulation. We encourage good regulation um, of the uh, online space. But the primary thing here, and this is why it has the 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 largest um, the largest bubble, is we're really keen on community self governance. Now, I realise that um, I'm speaking you, to you from a video link um, today, um, and. You have you all in the room have a much better idea of the of the the shape of the Ghanaian disinfo disinformation landscape than I do. So whilst we have the the expertise when it comes to looking at how these things manifest in different jurisdictions, we massively rely on a community that we hope to build and keep building um, in fighting disinformation. Um, across the globe. And in Ghana, that's no different. So we've zoomed in a little bit. Now, what I want to do is zoom in even more. So imagine on our camera lens, we're getting really close to the, to the, to the object that we're photographing now. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about anti-disinformation projects that, that, um, that use Wikipedia. So first of all, I want to 
to to uh, invite you um, to uh, read this anecdote. This is a, a rule that we use generally on English language Wikipedia um, that basically says, um, please don't teach anyone who wants to mess with our platform how to mess with it. So I would appreciate if the things that we speak about today can be things that you take away. Um, if you know anyone who frequently likes to vandalize Wikipedia, please do not tell them how to do this. <laughs> um, so this is the this is the anecdote that we uh, that we that we use as a kind of principle, um, and it's called beans. So the little boy's mother was going off to the market. She worried about her son, who was always up to some mischief. She sternly admonished him: "Be good. Don't get into trouble. Don't eat all the chocolate." Don't spill all the milk. Don't throw stones at the cow. Don't fall down the well. The boy had done all of these things on previous market days. Hoping to head off new trouble, she added, and don't stuff beans up your nose. This was a new idea for the boy who promptly tried it out. This is a principle that we tend to use on English Wikipedia um, because it's such an open platform. We encourage folks to engage fully in good faith. Um, so it's a principle to kind of keep in mind when you're speaking to people um, about Wikipedia and how it might be a useful thing to use. So let's get on to some of these um, specific projects. So um, around elections, um, my team runs what we call disinformation response task forces. Uh, we engage with folks from civil society organizations, um, edit, uh, key editing communities, um, and also folks from, from across the media um, to collaborate with us on these projects around elections. So on the left-hand side, you can see some of um, the examples of, of projects that, that we've run in the past um, and the Wikipedia language projects that, that we focused on in those jurisdictions. As you'll see for, for Brazil, we focus primarily on Portuguese Wikipedia as, as that was the, the kind of only language that we, we thought would be targeted with disinformation during that election. For Nigeria, we focused on four um, editing communities, English, Yoruba, Hausa, and Gungbe. Um, and this really varies depending on the number of languages spoken in a given jurisdiction. Um, as you can imagine, the European parliamentary elections this um, this summer just gone, we focused on lots of different uh, languages as there are 28 languages spoken in the European Union, whereas for, for the United States, we focused primarily on English. And from these task forces, we've, we've kind of learned um, lots of different things. First, that, as I said, disinformation on Wikipedia is very different from on social media. Um, second, that it shows up in different ways in different jurisdictions. So if I think back to the Brazilian elections, there were lots of issues around um, um, media articles being published around uh, specific Wikipedia e editors, lots of issues with doxing, whereas um, in the US that wasn't as much of a problem. Um, in Poland, there were legal threats, uh, where in Turkey we didn't see that. So the thing we've really learned is that the needs of uh, Wikipedia editing communities are very, very different um, in each case. And the responses um, that um, we build, along with um, folks from civil society, along with journalists in, in a given jurisdiction, need to be kind of tailored very specifically to the specific requirements of that community. The other thing we do quite often is we partner with academic institutions to try and, and get them to publish research about how um, Wikipedia deals with mis and disinformation. So this is a paper that was recently published um, and uh, it focuses on the US presidential election um, that's just passed. Um, and the aim of this uh, piece was um, to kind of assess the um, effectiveness measures of um, Wikipedia against misinformation dissemination over time 
um, focusing on both quantitative and qualitative methods to study um, politicians' pages. The, uh, the paper found that um, the risk of misinformation rose significantly um, throughout the election period. Um, but that but that also um, a significant portion of that misinformation was detected by existing editing mechanisms. So particularly um, these were focused on, uh, you know, overt cases like uh, factual in inaccuracies and vandalism. Um, they offered us some some recommendations for for improving the way that we go about um, things like fact checking. Um, and those are being built into our systems as we move. Now, here is a here is a specific example of a type of disinformation that that we've faced on Wikipedia in the past. This is an example from four years ago, from twenty twenty elections. So I'm sharing this in the knowledge that um, hopefully this is not too um, too fresh, um, and it's not an active campaign that we're looking at right now. But it's the type of thing that um, we're particularly concerned about um, at the Wikimedia Foundation. So in this example, a user impersonated a leading member of Joe Biden's campaign staff um, by using their, their name as a Wikipedia account name. That user then edited the Wikipedia page for Senator Tammy Duckworth. That edit was screenshotted. And here I'll point you back to Martin's uh, uh, excellent example from earlier about um, about the Nigerian politicians uh, page that was that was repeatedly vandalized. <laughs> It was then shared on Twitter and the Twitter account appeared to have been set up for this specific purpose. Now, this was pretty bad for the information ecosystem. Um, it went round that Tammy Duckworth was a serious candidate for VP, and this may have um, helped or hindered um, Joe Biden in his bid to become president that year. So this is the type of thing that we're trying desperately to avoid. Which brings me to the Ghana elections. Um, so zooming in to our kind of final destination here, um, this is the kind of tightest lens that I I would like to um, offer to you today. So there are lots of ways in which um, our foundation has partnered with um, other foundations, with editing communities, um, with academics, academics and these are some of the ways it, that that can look moving forward um so we can assist editing communities in, in identifying disinformation um, related to specific elections and on request investigating possible disinformation threats we can share um intelligence that we have with community volunteers who participate in our election integrity projects um we can um, provide a disinformation evaluation on a specific issue. Um, there was a famous one that we ran um, uh, in 2020 around the Croatian language Wikipedia. Um, and we can focus on other cooperation projects where um, where the local community is, is uh, interested in doing so. We can coordinate with our press team um, if the need arises. As I said before, there, there are sometimes press issues during election um during election periods that uh, we can help uh, coordinate with we can provide language support on on specific languages um in handling disinformation threats so martin's question does anyone speak russian in the room earlier hello i i speak russian um so something like that we i could have helped with um and specifically whenever a community feels like it's being overwhelmed with disinformation threats or threats against their physical safety or their content integrity, the foundation um, through our trust and safety disinformation team can be directed to issue office actions on accounts that pose threats to the community. So those are just some of the ways that we can, um, we can support editing communities, uh, but also support the wider information ecosystem. Um, and this brings me to kind of my 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 final point. And and here I I would like to open the floor um, for a discussion or or to answer some of these questions. And so I have three questions 
um, for our audience today. Um, and those are, what are the biggest disinformation challenges um, in the Ghanaian landscape during this election period? How do you expect these risks to manifest in relation to other types of common election problems? So um, are there big risks of doxing, harassment or legal threats for folks around these elections? And how can we come together um, as a community of uh, folks who work in the information space as disinformation specialists, as policy specialists, as journalists, as Wikipedia editors, as uh, employees of a, a prominent foundation, how can we best work together as a community to protect the information ecosystem? So with that, I will um, stop my presentation and I will invite um, thoughts and also questions from the floor, if that's okay. Okay, um, Nathan, in the meantime, please do not stop the presentation. We still want to see the questions. Yes. Of course, of course. Okay. You can clap if you're clapping. Can you clap for me? Okay, so questions, questions, questions. First question What are the biggest disinformation risks in the Ghanaian landscape during this election period? With what Martin's presented and what Nathan and Abigail has presented so far, and with your personal experiences as well, how can you answer this question? Yes. The biggest risk. Okay. Okay, so I think the biggest risk would be uh, fax check-in because fax check-in is the only thing that could stop um, mis- or disinformation. And to be able to check the facts, you have to Correlates um, information from different um, sources. So I think fact checking might, or no, the bigger, okay, fact checking is the solution. <laughs> okay, so the biggest risk would be, um, uh, should I say, translation and, and language rights, because in Ghana, we have, I think, 52 or 53 local languages. And not, how I many? 63? OK. Uh, but can someone fact check that for me? <laughs> right. So uh, basically, we have a lot of local languages. And you know, most of elections happen it will not happen in English. So the communication, the interpretation, the interactions will not happen in English. But most of the reputable news sources we have are in English. So I think the translation and the correlation between what the source said, what it actually means, the context, and also what is being written is going to be one of the biggest hindrances to, um, or one of the biggest risk to fact check. I hope now I am full. Yes, <laughs> of the right yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your submission. Um, anyone else? Still on the first question. Anyone else? I also feel that um, with all these that we are talking about, sometimes timely dissemination is also a problem. Because during elections, there's a whole lot going on. There's saturation with information everywhere. And doing fact checking also deals with time. And then trying to get what is accurate and what is right, is it also takes time. So sometimes before you realize, people don't even rely on media as much because we have social media at our disposal. So we, most people lean on that. And one funny thing I also believe is sometimes pictures and videos, like we spoke in the morning, pictures and videos tell different stories. From what I see, it would be different from somebody's perspective of how they see the picture or the video. So these things are all, you know, risk and other factors that you consider when trying to fact check something, an information or any news item. So 
sometimes um timely dis- dissemination is a is also a problem because you are fact checking at the same time waiting you know looking out for other you know um resources for for other um check check-ins and other things so it takes time so sometimes even before you get the facts right you see that the information or the the fake news have has gone all over so it becomes difficult to now you know try to re um recorrect all those things so i think it's one of those risks as well and then one thing that i also believe that um we can do for me i believe that this this has been long coming and over the years i think it should have been improved by now and if um organizations like yours and other um media outlets would also be educated more if the electoral commission can also do constant education in different languages on the TVs. It should be more because we cannot do this alone as media personnel. So what about our mothers and other siblings that are home who are always on social media? If they have this fair knowledge, they can and also know which news are fake and, and genuine. But because they don't have this kind of knowledge about how to fact check things and then see which ones are credible, they are always also believing and, you know, always intertwining we find ourselves in arguments because this is what this this is what somebody is seeing and this is what we are also trying to teach them so there's always you know a confusion somewhere yes thank you great 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 submissions um any other one before we move to the next question you wake wow okay no before james um, any any anyone else sorry i was just gonna uh, uh, could i um, respond to that last one okay sure nathan yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's a really good point about um, timely dissemination. And, and you mentioned um, sort of election uh, organizations um, on the ground. And I think they're the places really that are really, it's really important to have the, the, the kind of infrastructure built up around those election organizations because you're right, the media can't do all of that job. And actually, the 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 value of a fact check as you say becomes um becomes less uh, it becomes less valuable if no one looks at them um and so that um that timely dissemination i think should sometimes fall to the the election organizing organization um i think where um where fact checks can be really really useful is after the fact and i appreciate then at some point the mis and disinformation has had some kind of effect, but there is some value, I think, in in producing a fact check in order that it is a reliable source that we can say, hey, we know that previously this was disseminated with the intent to harm, and we can record that perhaps in an encyclopedia like Wikipedia, but also perhaps elsewhere in a media archive um, to try and um, learn from those things moving forward. So I think it's a really, really good point about timely dissemination. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, should we move on to the next question? Yeah, uh, by all means. Okay. So next question reads, um, how do you expect these rigs to manifest in relation to other types of common election problems, such as doxing, harassment, or legal threats? Should I take it again? Okay. So how do you expect these risks to manifest in relation to other types of common election problems, such as doxing, harassment, or legal threats? Any so submission? Yeah. Maybe I can unpack the question a little bit. I realize it's... Okay, Nathan. I realize okay. reading it back that I've written a, an essay instead of a question. Um, <laughs> um, so... Quite quite often, the the threats that that come with disinformation disinformation is not only an online problem, as far as I'm concerned. Um, quite often, we see um, threats to people who try and stand in the way of disinformation, um, be that a, a legal threat. Um, um, so, for example, in the US, you've seen people being um, threatened on the grounds that they're they're 
um, impeding someone's free speech, um, be it harassment in certain in certain jurisdictions, people are harassed for for opposing disinformation, um, or doxing. So on on Wikipedia, as you know, we encourage folks to be anonymous when they edit. This is so that they can maintain their safety um, if they're editing on something that's particularly um, politically sensitive. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of asking um, whether you, you foresee issues such as doxing, harassment or legal threats during this election period, um, or whether we're focused primarily on the online sphere only. Got it. Any submission? Or if you still want him to clarify, you can. So how do these rigs that um, James and your name, please, your name, please. So how do the rigs um, that James and Chantel mentioned earlier can um, impact or cause situations such as harassment, legal threats, or doxing in real life? In the context of the Ghanaian elections. Yes, in that context, yeah. Any submission? Legal threats, harassment. I think for harassment, okay. Um, I think um, there was a situation where um, Manasi wrote a book and then indicated that using um, Ibrahim Mahama that he borrowed money somewhere. And it came out that it wasn't him, but his company. And that if he doesn't retract um, that information, he will be held reliable or he'll be um, um, sued. So I, I think that in, in that context, when it comes to um, our election, um, it will let a lot of people be afraid to come out to um, fight against misinformation and disinformation. I think recently there was um, an MPP communicator who said that um, when you go to the election and you don't like Mahama, just start from one and start uh, turn printing up to um, you get to the eight. So that shows that you don't like um, Mahama. Uh, so it, it's a way of uh, giving a wrong information to um, the electorate. So if someone comes out to fight against that, probably the party members will also um, either harass the person for trying to spoil their agenda. So I think that uh, there, there's risk in fighting um, misinformation or disinformation. Okay, so another thing that um, I also realized, um, he actually drew my attention to it with his second example. There are some informations that I think are mistakenly um, disseminated in the sense that this, I, I think I heard this on radio, where the person was actually showing how somebody can vote. So I listened to it several times. I thought about it and I realized that before I was even thinking it was a joke. Then I thought about it again and I realized that no, the person was actually not communicating well what he wants to say. So the person wanted to show how you would, you know, vote for the person beneath those people that are above, but then he didn't communicate well. So that's where another problem comes because if I would think about it twice and know that, okay, it's either this way or that way, the next person who is an illiterate, or doesn't really understand what you know it means, what um, the lecture commission is expecting our citizens to do, would equally do what the person is saying. But in actual sense, we are seeing it as is either the person is is giving a misinformation, but it's actually the person not communicating well. So that's another problem we would face most of the time as well. Okay. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you. Okay, James again. 
Okay, so how do you expect these rates to manifest? Okay, so far, there was this popular story of a blogger who went to jail for reporting um, a fake news around um, withdrawals from banks in 2022. And now he said that he copied the story from another uh, website, right? And that's a common practice in Ghana. They call it journalism. So instead of, for example, um, Media House A writing their story, and then Media House B also going to do their research to write their story, Media House B will say that, okay, Media House A has written the story, so let me just go and copy that, and then credit them that they wrote the story. So according to Media House A, you know, they... This is what it is. But they themselves have not done any proper uh, fact check. They've not done any proper editorial work. And I think these risks, because, you know, the, the election is a very time-sensitive event, right? So if you look at the U.S. elections, the results were announced in, I think, 36 hours after the close of votes. And in media, you know, clicks and engagements are the rule of the day. So it's like, who can deliver the news faster is who actually gets the clicks, who actually eventually gets the monetization. So the speed of news is actually going to be uh, more precedented over the accuracy or the, uh, should I say, the correctness of the news. So I think that's one, Rick. Um, it could heighten journalism, which is not a good practice. And hopefully there could be a bit of regulation action, regulatory action towards um, the release of such information. Thank you. Thank you so much, James, again. Um, any, any more submission? Before we move on to the last question, I'm guessing most of you have probably read the last question and have answers. So do we have answers to the last question before I read? Okay, so the last question reads, how can we best work together as a community to protect the information ecosystem? So how can we best work together as a community to protect the information ecosystem? So I believe this also includes uh, Wikipedia editors, um, journalists, every okay, yes. Yeah. So how can we best work together as a community to protect the information ecosystem? My Wikipedia editors, I'll be coming to you as well because our answers have been from the journalists. Or well, let's take it from two points of views, right? Um, first, the Wikipedia editors, then the media. Do we agree? So we want to take answers to this question from um, two perspectives, right? First, from Wikipedia editors. Secondly, from journalists. So before anything goes on Wikipedia, we'd have to get credible information from um, journalists, the media, yes. So it's important that we also get both perspectives. So I'm going to start with uh, Wikipedia editors. Wow, our noble journalists think of the answer. Thank you. Please, when I come, nobody should delay. I beg you. So my Wikipedia editors, you're not doing anything on the laptop. I beg you. So, <laughs> <Hello. laughs> mm. so, so let me take the question again. How can we best work together as a community to protect the information ecosystem as a Wikipedian? Thank you. So I think for starters, we are all aware the guidelines. So we need to make sure that the guideline is a religious scripture. Like what we use it as a way to make sure that the information you are putting out there, even though you may have certain um, strong emotions towards a particular content, you know that you need to have a neutral point of view that is reflective of the source that you are using. So if the source is indicating a particular approach and what you are feeling about that particular topic does not correlate, you need to make sure that you stick with what the guideline is providing. That's what helps to ensure that some form of disinformation is not um, encouraged on the platform. And secondly, we also need to be um, continue building consensus. 
So if you have an information, you have something that you feel that, okay, this content is what I've got from this um, source. What are you getting from your end if you're able to search up these um, sources based on this topic? So if you're able to do that, it also helps us to make sure that we are harmonizing and building consensus on the kind of aggregation we are putting on the platform to ensure that this information is nipping the bud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ezekiel. Anyone else? Okay, Justin. So um, I think with information sharing, one of the like most important thing is always verify. So to able to protect yourself or your community, always share verified information. Always make sure that you triple check and like multiple check any information you are putting out there. I think that is like the basic thing you can do for yourself. Yeah. Thank you so much, Justice. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll repeat it. Okay, so just a quick one. I think um as as we um editors, I think one of the things we also have to check is the source of where the information is coming from, right? Is it a credible source? You know, as much as it's, it's coming from a credible source, we also have to do a double check again before we can put it out there for the public to also consume. So I think, essentially, these are some of the ways where, as editors, we also need to check. And also, um, in as much as we also edit uh, more capacity building and workshop training, are also being organized for editors to also attend and also uh, update themselves when it comes to new trends on the on the on the system as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, James, are you answering? Sorry, are you answering as a Wikipedian or as a media person? Um, let Let me match. Let me match. So, uh, I think there was a time when I was writing at, at school, and then one of the administrators sent me some guidelines as to what to look out for when you are referencing a topic, right? So if you open any article on any website, one, you have to ask yourself, does it have an author? So if it's on whatever platform, there has to be a written by, and then there has to be a name on it so that it shows that it is reported by, for example, Eugene. And Eugene writes for um, what's the name? Yes, Ofwa, right? Um, the second thing you have to ask yourself is if the person is actually a staff editor or a contributor, right? Because staff editors have certain protocols that they go through when they are editing. So it is much more streamlined versus um, an external contributor who may not necessarily go through that um, that rigorous check-in because it's basically their opinion that they are sharing. So it may be checked for grammar and um, a few other things, but it will not be checked for some things because it's, um, it's, it's, it's a contributor's voice. And then usually the platform dissociates themselves from what the contributor says. So... I think the first or the major things you have to look at is where the thing is published and also who is publishing it. And if it has, you know, the date and the timeline of the publication. Yes. So thank you. Thank you so much, James. And before I um, come to our media personnel, I just want to give um, some context to the answers that they gave. So tracking back to Nathan's presentation, realize that before any information goes on Wikipedia, it has to come from a credible source. And we want information from credible sources. And we assume that the media, right, give out credible information. Okay, so the information that we put on Wikipedia is from you. Because we are assuming that it's credible, right? So um, based on the answers that they've given so far, you realize that most of them are along the lines of double check, verify, if it's either from a credible media house or if the information is actually what's credible. So as journalists, right, here and here in uh, Wikipedians, as journalists, how best can we work together as a community to protect the information ecosystem? Okay. As a Wikipedia, okay, sure. I think during elections, uh, one of 
the most issues is vandalism, pages, page vandalism. And as we keep as Wikimedia, uh, as Wikipedia editors, we must try to protect those pages and monitor them, I mean, on live to fight against those uh, fake news some people can add. That's all. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ronnie. Um, so our journalists, anyone? Anyone who wants to break the ice? Chantel, okay. I think um, first and foremost, we we'll still have to remind NCA their responsibilities and what they can do to improve information dissemination and communications in general in Ghana. And then for me, last but not the least, will be that we have to be um, information literate in the sense that we can have all these informations online, news sources, anything at all we want. But then if we don't constantly put ourselves to search for, you know, um, genuine um, information, we'll still not have that knowledge about what it is that we need to understand. So being information literate is also equally important. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Chantel wants me to say something. Okay, so I want to say something about the misinformation. Um, some of us, let me blend the tree and then the English, because we were tree station. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Nathan. Oh, okay, so I can go on. Okay. Concerning um misinformation, most Ghanaians know Obian is a source of the Bia or J ni information war. Others believe in social media, others believe in online um websites, news, others to believe um what radio presenters will say and then TV. Into if say um a TV presenter is saying something different. And then a radio presenter too is saying something different, as well as social media, which is the bloggers, are saying something different. Um, these three, I think these three or four, they cause at times cause the misinformation. Because 2020, I can't remember 2020 election. During that time, uh, Omo Bebobono, Ube Musa Ada Media House, the TV, no, ni figures are different. Ube call online, na figures ni be different. Obeko a red view, no more body different figure. Website, no be actual different figure. Nina, it to me a channel to this misinformation. It to me, Emma, near any say, like, a see among Ghanaians, no, any to see. So to me, no, I think, say, I was say education, a call more, Senator Chantel, Cassa, easy, I was say, or Oman church, or more, yes, a cotua bank one, and in church, and Namomo Yen so. But and the media for bloggers for no more spread information and only more or she them crana or different people see or share the video to me on see you know so actual different headline just to catch or get attention. So I think say more engage bloggers so a bit to me about to stop this misinformation ahead of the election. Thank you. Okay, so uh, mine is on um, understanding the newsmaker's point of view. If somebody gives you a content and we do not understand it very well, but then we sit down trying to come up with what the person really said, we tend to misinform the public. And this has been happening. Sometimes media houses would um, broadcast a story and at the end of the day the person will come back to say i didn't say this no this wasn't what i said so pull the story down that is when we come back to render apology to whom the newsmaker is and that thing has really really been in the system for long and i think that it is dragging the name of the media in fact the Ghanaian journalist in the mad which we should look at because we tend to misinform the public of what the newsmaker actually uh, said 
And then there's one thing too, that maybe it is a practice in our newsroom, but then I believe that if we all inculcate it in our various media outlets, maybe it will help. Not every story should be told. That is what my news editor tells me. There are certain stories that you know, especially during election period like this, that when it comes out, it may breed some level of hatred towards a particular tribe or a particular political party. So it is best that such stories, we do not let it come to the, uh, the public or even get it to the, the space so that it doesn't bring up any form of hatred or any form of tension into the system. So although we want to tell the story, although we want to share it to get the mileage, but then when it jeopardizes with the security of the country, it is better to be hidden than to be revealed. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Um, I'd like to add that with the, the emergence of social media has brought about a silent competition among mainstream media um, on who gets it first. So, instead, so uh, most media houses or most newsrooms fail to do the investigations, the needed checks to verify on whatever information they are getting. And then because we want to be the first to break it, once we get it, we are going with it, maybe because the person we, we got the information from is someone we trust. But I think it's about time the media kills, agree to kill that silent competition and go back to getting it right, doing our verifications before we release stories to the public. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Docas. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes and Docas, for those great submissions. And you guys have been selling for too long. I mean, giving great submissions. I think if, if you had spoken earlier by now, points would be mad. Anyway, um, any, any other submission? Any other submission? Maybe just one more. Just one. One more. Ah, thank you, Timothy. Uh, I'm thinking that um, if we have um, journalists come together, like a chamber or something, where probably we have a body to, even though we have GJ, which is there, but I think that there should be a, a, a source where when information comes out and you go there, you'll be able to fast, uh, fact check so that it will be easy for everybody to be in line so that this person doesn't come out with an information. Another station comes with a different information, like we're saying, almost like a competition. Everybody's trying to um, catch up early. And, but if we have a particular place, that, okay, so for here, if you go there, you can verify whether what you are hearing or what is going on is true or not. I think it will also help. Thank you. Sure. So, so on this, this is from listening to everyone and, and I mean, great submissions and all that, but I, I have a principle that sometimes I work with. So for instance, we're in an electioneering period. So I work with a principle that I trust no source. That's not to say that I won't pick from them, but because we are in a very unique season, things would be different. Even your most trusted would have their biases and things like that. So that's why there's a need, like all the editors have said, all the journalists have said here, there's a need to always cross-check. Even if it's from a trusted source, you should be sure. Because you, you would be surprised to even find out that even an institution like the police could be sending out information that would turn out to be misinformation because their bosses who have interests have told them, look, go with this. And they run and tell us. So some of these things, I think that, again, much as we have trusted sources, around this period where we're in an election season, we should always be slow to run with what we get. That way we can protect more of what we have. Yeah. Actually, can there be a situation, or maybe in the future, that during elections like this, uh, no media house should project 
any figure until we get there. Actually, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Would, would, would any, any media person want to? Okay. So I, I think what my sister is saying, the figures no, a young yes, but yes, because an internet is a mobile kind of media for like, we, okay, sorry. That's why when they're about to count, maybe the district um, EC officer, when they're about to count the media, we go forward a bit and then we zoom our camera or our phone to make sure that we get everything on point. If not because of the figures, I don't think it's necessary for us to go there. Do you get it? Because the way they have lined up now, we will be there and wait for them. But we can't do without the figures. We have to show our figures. We are the one on the field. So we are the one telling our news editor and the producer, as you may see, or oh, this uh, man had this amount of number. So that's what they are also they have to also project, okay? And then what other reporter too is saying is different. That one idea, I know me, I'm doing my own part and the other one too is not doing her own part. I can give an example at Ableikuma. Is it a kind quest out? Um, Kion, is it Kion? Yeah. During the, this thing, the primaries, NDC primaries, one of my sister from multimedia, she reported that the security system and things are this and that. Immediately she finished reporting and she left the place. And then one policeman came and asked me, why is the other lady from multimedia? And I, was, I told him that she's not here, she's gone. Do you get it? So it depends. Reports are beyond any interest. Are you getting me? So this is what I have to say. Thank you. I'm adding up to hers. Um, the need for us to be there is also because we also need to be able to balance the, <laughs> the information space. Because if the media doesn't have figures, and then we sit down and all we do is to relay what has been shared, that's why what, what we have is called provisional. And we hear them, there's evidence. You have voices, you have videos. This person saying, this is the number of people who voted here all of that, then by the time an official result comes from the EC or something, we can then go back and do our own checks. So, so it's important that we do that, of course, not to call the elections. That's wrong. But we can always project what we have as numbers. Just a little to add up to what they've said already. I think that we should look at how crucial the Ghanaian landscape is. The media is perceived to be the fourth arm of government, perceived to be. It means that we play a very pivotal role in every aspect of the Ghanaian politics and even the Ghanaian terrain. If a media person is on the field or if there is a reporter on the field who has been able to collate figures from um, a polling station or even the coalition center. And then these figures, of course, just like my colleague said, they are back with fact. There are videos whatsoever to rate. At the end of the day, you know that my constituency, these were the number of figures that this particular party had or this particular party also had. And so at the end of the day, if the coalition center comes up with a different figure, then you would be able to know that, no, something fishy had gone on. And already, trust me, we have issues with the electoral commission because of the partisan card that has been played all along. This person will come and say, well, this, because this um, electoral commissioner wasn't appointed by me, because she is doing this, because he or she is doing that, that person is not credible. So you can't trust the work that he or she is doing. So at the end of the day, political parties are spearheading bad news about a political, uh, what do we call it, the electoral commission. So if you have the journalist on the field giving you figures that is backed by facts, then it means that accepting an electoral result wouldn't be difficult. But if there is no one on the field and an electoral commission who is not trustworthy to the people comes out with figures, then it means at the end of the day, people will say that, no, these figures can be tr trusted. The election has been rigged. But if we have a journalist who has been able to do much of the work or most of the work, then if the actual or let me say the final result comes out, it is not difficult to accept. So the journalist plays a crucial role and we shouldn't just say because of one or two things that have gone wrong over the years, 
we should just get them off our election process. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And Nathan, as you just witnessed, we have experienced and very smart media personnel and Wikipedia editors here. And um, the last question, I think it was, it was just best that it was the last question because that was where we got a lot of you know, great submissions. So yeah, here you go, unless you want more because I, I can feel the heat in the room and I know that a lot of people have more submissions, <laughs> but if you do not want more, you can proceed, Nathan. And thank you yeah. everyone for your submissions. Yeah. I, w I wanted to thank everyone as well. I thought that was a really, really fruitful discussion. It was really interesting to hear from both Wikimedians and um, media folks as well. I just wanted to finish with this and I'll put these links in the chat so that folks from the Open Foundation can, can share these on to folks in the room. Um, we have a couple of resources that might be um, interesting or useful for folks. Um, including a, a Disinfo 101 training module um, for Wikimedians, um, a little bit of a, a post by that was written by me to explain how to report disinformation within the Wikimedia ecosystem. And then we also have a repository of anti-disinformation projects that might be interesting for folks as well. Um, please do get in touch over the election period if there are any concerns that you have about disinformation on Wikipedia uh, on Wikipedia in particular um, or on any of the um, free knowledge projects. Uh, my email is at the bottom of the slide there. Um, otherwise, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to everyone in the room. I think it's been a, a really engaging discussion. Um, and yeah, I hope that we can we can collaborate um, moving forwards and in the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Nathan. And um, this has been a very interactive session, especially the second um, session. I didn't, I didn't foresee um, great submissions and engagements like this, but I, I'm, I'm glad that submissions were given, arguments were had, and you know, questions were asked. Right. So um, before. Before we leave, we would want to know if there are any questions for Nathan and Abigail. Any questions for Nathan and Abigail? Okay. So my name is Quebec. I don't know if for I don't know if this question is for Nathan or Abigail or for Open Foundation West Africa. And I took two key issues from this interactions. One, if you can combat misinformation and disinformation, the media is very, very key in this. And if you can make Wikipedia a very credible source, the media in Ghana is key here as well. And my question is, can the media in Ghana or the journalists help us to create articles on Wikipedia? Can the journalists become Wikipedians? If yes, how would they do so? I think the last part of the question goes to um, Nathan and probably Open Foundation West Africa, but the first part goes to um, journalists, yes. So, yes, Timothy. All right, so um, my question is, um, well, <laughs> no, 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 I'm also adding my question. <laughs> Oh, so the first part of his questions were actually directed to uh, media personnel, and the second part were directed to the Wikimedia community. So anyone, or, or kindly ask the question. The journalists, I was saying, I'll make it a point that the journalists are going to help us to combat misinformation. So I want to know, how would the journalists join the Wikipedia community, or can the journalists become a Wikimedia and write credible articles I could answer this question, but I'm going to leave it for our volunteers, right? Seasoned volunteers, anyone? Okay, Justice. Yeah. yeah uh, I think, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, we actually encourage journalists to become Wikipedia editors because by their training, they possess some of the necessary skills that we need on Wikipedia. So we, we want more of journalists to become 
Wikipedia editors. The only caveat is you can't use your stories as sources as on the platform. You can just cite other credible sources. So that's what I think. And to, to back what Justice just said, so um, just like Nathan and I said earlier, before anything goes on Wikipedia, it has to be a credible source, right? Or it has to be credible information from a credible source. And we mostly get this information from media outlets, right? So um, the Wikimedia Foundation has a lot of communities around the world. And in Ghana, we have um, a number of them. But in this room, we have two. We have Open Foundation West Africa, and we have Wikimedia Ghana, right? And we all have our, you know, separate projects where we engage professionals in different sectors. Sometimes we engage media people, sometimes we engage educators, librarians, or what's not. So anyone at all can actually be a Wikimedian, or anybody at all can actually contribute on Wikipedia, right? So since you are here, since you're in the room full of um, Wikimedians, which is people from Open Foundation West Africa and Wikimedia Ghana, I assume that you're automatically Wikipedians. And going back to the WhatsApp group, right? We are going to create this WhatsApp group. We are going to engage you whether you like it or not. Right? Because you are, you, are, you are very essential to us. Whatever you put out there is what we also put out there. Right. So we have to, you know, deal with you directly. We, we do not have to get information from bloggers or from someone just, you know, writing um, some book and book stories from his room. Right. We, we believe that you are professionals and we want to work with you. So to answer the Kubeko's question, yes, a journalist can be a Wikipedian. And thank you for agreeing to the fact that you are now all Wikipedians. Right. I, I would like to, to answer him too. Uh, it's not especially about Ghana, but I'd like to share. Oh, yes, uh, my name is Ezen Kokuroni. I'm co-founder of Wikimedia of Burkina Faso. Uh, for instance, at Burkina Faso, the main members of our, of our community are journalists. Myself, I'm a journalist. All, I mean, we are more than 30 people. The, um, I mean, the quarter of that uh, of our members are journalists so we we know how to work on wikipedia we know how to produce articles and how to combine uh, the both so it's, you can be a wikimedian as being a journalist so that's yeah, possible right. yeah okay so <clears throat> my question is almost in line with what we are we are saying so um for instance um someone is a citizen journalist or social media or private journalist freelance um how does he get his if he goes to do his own story and wants to put it on wikipedia and now that we are saying that it has to come from a credible source or credible media house how can that person or who should the person I'll be putting if it is the story is the story is coming from him as an individual or as a freelance um, journalist? I could answer this question, but let me leave it to the Wikipedia. No, let me leave it to Nathan. Nathan, please. I, w I was going to say, you have lots of uh, Wikipedia experts in the room that maybe <laughs> answer this very yeah. well. Um, I would just say, um, you have to always be careful of conflict of interest. If you are um, producing a story yourself, you obviously have an interest in sharing that story. Um, Wikipedia is not the outlet for that. Wikipedia, as we were speaking about earlier, is the outlet for um, aggregating all of the reliable sources on a particular topic. If you wanted to share your story um, for amplification, social media is perfect for that, right? Um, Wikipedia is more to yeah aggregate all of those things in one place if you're if you're if your story um is reliable is if it's published in a reliable um place other wikipedians may use it as a source um i would encourage particularly citizen journalists to have things that are um freely licensed so that people can access that material freely 
that would that would mean that it's more likely to be um cited in something like wikipedia but i would always point back to um conflict of interest um i i know that wikipedians take this very very seriously um and so uh they would likely have some some problems with that as well maybe i should pass it back to folks in the room to add to that okay thank you thank you nathan and any submission from a wikipedian to answer okay justice yeah so um another thing i i would add to it is um for usually uh, media houses that we cite um they should have at least an editorial board that is very credible we just don't cite any uh websites or blogs so so far as you have an editorial policy and a board and it's not like a one-man run blog or something we can use it so maybe pitching your story to any of these media organizations might be the best to to pull your story out there and if it's credible enough, um, any Wikimedia editor can use it for any article they want to work on. Thank you so much, Justice. Okay. So I also add that um, Wikipedia deals with collaboration. So in case you are with a credible um, source let's say a credible media house that we can source and you write an article you can write a story yourself on wikipedia you can contact any of the wikipedia if you are in the group and then contact one person that will have this article check it out if you think it fits wikipedia policy and that person will use it to you know cite the article thank you so much mr beko um do we have any other question for Nathan before he goes, or for us, or for Wikipedians, I mean, any other question? Okay, so if we do not, oh, James. Okay. <laughs> okay, so since Nathan is here, I think uh, I should ask this question. So currently there's this new practice of putting information behind um, paywalls. Right, so how do we cite these information? If to verify them, you have to pay a dollar or two or three, you know. So how do we literally go behind paywalls to get information that we need for our articles? Um, I hope the Ghanaian community doesn't start that. But, you know, sometimes it's very frustrating, you know, when you go on to... Um, the New York Times, and they have to pay, you know, to read an article. And the information you're looking for is, is under <laughs> the page. It's not even the open um, paragraph. So, yes, how do we how do we battle that? And what what would be the way around this? Okay, that's a it's a very good question because I think it's something that Wikipedians in lots of different parts of the world face. It's something that frustrates me so much when I come across a really nice article and then I can't access it um, because it's behind a paywall. One thing I would point you towards as a, as a Wikipedian is the Wikipedia library. Um, I'm putting the link in the chat right now um, alongside some of the other links that I've posted there. The Wikipedia library has a, has a, a load of subscriptions to things um, such as um, news outlets, but also academic journals that can be used as sources um, by Wikimedians who want to um, add things to Wikipedia or even just access those articles. There are some restrictions on it. I think you have to have 500 edits um, on Wikipedia, but I think that's a, a reasonable way around for a Wikipedian to, to kind of access some of that stuff. And I too kind of share your hope that Ghanaian media doesn't go in that direction. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, any any more question? Okay, so, so if we do not have any question, um, Nathan, thank you. Thank you so much for this insightful session. And I know we've bombarded, we bombarded you with a lot of 
questions and engagements and then all that. Please let's all clap for Nathan. He has done a great job. And a thank you to you guys as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So till next time, see you, Nathan. Bye. Cheerio. Okay. And um Hi, everyone. So there's something that we did not do at the beginning of this session, uh, which I think if we do not do that before we leave, um, yes, it's just not right. Right. Even though we call it an introduction, we are going to do it at the end of the session. So you might not know who will be in this room, and particularly for us that wants uh, media personnel to be Wikipedians, would want everyone to introduce themselves, just so if you are interested in becoming a Wikipedian, or just so if you are a Wikipedian, interested in becoming a journalist you know you can connect <laughs> and then yeah take it from there so i'm going to start from james right i'm going to start from here and then we'll take it there then we'll end with uh, meow tuba right please do not leave i beg you please do not leave let's just do this quick so you just mention your name and the organization you are with that's all i right, thank you hi Hi, so um, a lot of you know me by now. Uh, my name is James. I'm at a former media. I used to work in the media now. I mostly work around open data, um, language Wikimedia, which is 